Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the second of our double bill today. And the first show, if you didn't see it, Philip Bradley was taking us through an incredible raid in New Guinea in 1942. And it was a slick presentation with a beginning, middle and end. I have to say, one of the things I'm looking forward to about this afternoon's uh, or this evening's show is it's going to be a little bit more sprawling because it's going to be a kind of a conversation between two people. We'll jump off some of the things you say on the comments. And I've got video clips of mine. Michael's got some uh, images and things like that. And it's going to basically going to be a conversation about the Stutzpunt that is at vierville sur mer so the western end of Omaha Beach. So Michael Ackerman, my guest, is a filmmaker and also does a lot of work on Facebook groups, adding to the database of knowledge about Omaha Beach. And he's done some sterling work in his last couple of years, investigating aerial photos and, and other sources. Made a few friends here in Normandy who've been getting him photos and archives. He's been using the Vierville Sir Mayor website. And he's come up with a lot of kind of new theories and ideas about some of the defenses and the bunkers and the guns. So that's what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to bring him into the show now. So um, hi, Mike. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Paul? Thanks for having me on. I'm good. So, as I said, that we, you know, we, you've you've been doing kind of a lot, a lot of work on Facebook groups and on your own page about this. And before we kind of dive into talking about Vierville Samir, what what is it about a Normandy, b Omaha, and c that particular end of Omaha Beach that kind of um that, that got under your skin? Yeah. Um. You know, I, I hate to uh to kind of play into uh you know the stereotypes of like millennials who are into this kind of thing. But, uh, you know, honestly, it probably started with Saving Private Ryan when I was a little kid. You know, I saw that movie, made a huge impression on me as a filmmaker and someone who was interested in this this stuff. But, uh, you know, and from there, I wanted to just know more about it. I wanted to just, you know, I was fascinated by it. I thought it was really interesting. I, I um, always have kind of been into war history. You know, like I say, as a kid seeing that movie, then, you know, of course, growing up playing you know, Medal of Honor and Call of Duty and stuff like that. But as I've, be, you know, grown into an adult, you know, I've just gone more into it in terms of the actual factual stuff. And that's what I've always kind of wanted to know. And um, I've always been more interested in the, the historical side of things rather than, you know, the fiction, the historical fiction, if you were. So um, I always wanted to know, you know, about the actual battle, not just, you know, what a movie depicted so i started doing a lot of research when i was probably probably like in high school is when i really started to kind of hone in on this on omaha beach and as the more it unfolded the more i learned about it the more i was like realizing that you know how uh you know fictional saving private ryan is and everything like that and then i kind of became you know like a uh you know kind of get, went on this this tirade of you know like trying to dispel all these myths and stuff like that and uh which I'm, i know you know all about um and that's one of the most uh, important things, in my opinion, is to try and get the actual story out and the actual facts um, and dispel a lot of things that have been created through mythology and stuff like that. Because I see that a lot with history. It turns into mythology and people don't really see it as an actual thing that happened. So um, that's kind of where it's all started was probably with uh, movies and video games and such. And then I just as I grew older, I wanted to uh, get more serious about it. And I think, and thanks for that, I think the thing is, the advantage you came at it is some of us, Colin's watching this, my best mate here in Normandy, is we've been living near Normandy, for, you know, Omaha Beach for 20 odd years. And I think we're still a little bit guilty of sticking with the things we read 30 and 40 years ago, because that's the thing is these ideas get a bit kind of stuck and mm -hmm. they get in one book and a second book and a third book and then another website, then a blog and, and the tour guide industry, you know, we, 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 we repeat things because they work and you point at something and go, this is what this was. And, and what Steve Zaloga and people like yourself have, have, have made us realize is that sometimes you've got to go back and say, well, why have we always been saying that about that thing? Why did we say that's a machine gun? Why did we say that's a particular type of machine gun or weapon? And actually sometimes when you go back and look at the evidence, it turns out that what we've been saying isn't entirely, entirely correct. So, yeah. Um, and that's the, that's the challenge, isn't it? We're learning all the time. And you, you, uh, Colin was really impressed when I told him the other day that you, you, a friend of someone else you knew had sent the picture of the the bunker on the uh, the other side, the western side of the D1 draw of Yeovil somewhere. And I've been uh, yeah. driving up and down that road for at least thirty odd years, and I I always thought it had gone. I mean, okay, it's apparently it's very hard to go and find. And me and Colin will go and try and find it sometime in the winter. But that's amazing that you over there, the other side of the. <laughs> has found out something about Omaha Beach that those of us who live right near it have not found. But anyway. 
we're well, going to be talking about the, the four Vitas Stones Nest, maybe concentrating on two or three of them rather than four, that the Germans group together into one Stutz point, which is the Vitas Stones are sort of separate resistance nests, and then they group them together into a larger one because, you know, as we know, D1 became the draw that, the only one that had the, the paved road on it up it so the germans obviously identified it as being crucial to that sector and they put a lot of defenses in there and of course as you said yourself that's where seven private ryan ended up being set so that's why the interest has been there so either which do you want to start with 71 or 72 or seven where, where do you want to start michael i think uh, it actually might be more uh, a little more interesting to go backwards and start at 74 um because the the more you go to 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 uh the more you go down in terms of numerics it gets uh more interesting in my opinion um so there we go yeah now um paul because you've lived there for a long time um you're I, i'm probably gonna butcher so many french names in this like uh so you're gonna have to like correct me on a lot of stuff um but uh so how do you say that uh that specific um that that specific structure that comes out right there is point uh point de la per se is that how it's point de la per se, yes yeah okay. exactly yeah and that, so what we're looking at there folks is is the bunkers to the left you can see the square opening up just to the right of that white chalet that's part of that in 73 and then 74 would be kind of in the middle of the photo over there and then right down the end that, often people say that's point du hoc but point du hoc is of course beyond those sort of cliffs it's actually round a slight corner but point de la per se also juts out there so we are looking there folks if you've not been to normandy west and that footage i took from the jetty that comes off in front of the bunkers at seat 72 so that's that's it's obviously winter this this footage was taken and, and a couple of years ago now so so 74 is the one say, in the middle of that photo there and i've of the four it's the one where we probably know the least because yeah. it 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 seems to get a bit misrepresented and misunderstood because there's the radar installation that's around there as well. There's the fake guns from Point of Hawk that are in the same kind of area. So it all gets a bit muddled. So what what have you worked out about Venus Lonzo 74? Well, it's one that I'm still currently trying to unearth stuff about. I mean, I do know that I had a number of, uh, not a number, I think it was only like maybe two or three of those uh, Skoda guns that were there. Um, and, uh, in kind of these, these very makeshift, uh, like nests that were kind of in the cliffs, uh, that was facing, uh, eastwards, but, uh, there's no, there's no real, um, uh, testimonies that I've heard that there was ever really any kind of fighting at WN 74. I think it was used more as like a deterrent for the radar station and, yeah. uh, and was kind of just there to, to. To guard it in a way and it's kind of bizarre that it's technically part of stutzpunkt vierville because it's quite a ways away from it um you know you would think that like maybe wn70 was part of stutzpunkt vierville instead of 74 but um no it is technically part of it but uh one interesting thing about it that i did find was that um one of my friends over there who you know as well uh he does like drone footage around vierville and stuff like that and he got all this great footage of this um of this uh, uh, observation post, and we'll look at that in a minute. But uh, this image that I have pulled up right now, before I show that, this is WN seventy four taken around sometime in the afternoon on D Day by a uh, aerial reconnaissance plane that swept along all the beaches right here. And what's the most interesting thing about this? You see these little red marks here. Those are bomb craters where the bombs from the from the early morning had kind of overshot a lot of the German nests and landed inland. You always hear about that happening. But this is really interesting because this photo actually shows it. You can see it. Mm. You know, you can see these cluster here, boom, 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 and then these ones over here, boom, 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 and then one's even all the way out here. So that's pretty crazy. And then, interestingly, not not the ten miles. Some people say it is. You know, <laughs> I, I, again and again, people say, "Oh, all it did is kill cattle miles of land." You're going, no, no, hundreds no, of it, yards maybe, but not miles. That's again, that's one of those exaggerations of you. I've heard people say that all oh, the bombs landed miles in land, as you can no. see there. <laughs> It's it's three or four fields. Yeah, no, that's 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 fine. I haven't heard that, but that doesn't surprise me with a lot of mythology and stuff that comes along in this. But even then, you can see there are parts of W. This is set W and seventy four down here. There are parts of it that looks like they did receive some kind of shelling of some kind. You just see like craters yeah. and stuff out here. So it did not go untouched completely. And actually, Paul, as we get closer to W and seventy one, these giant craters, you can see these like like right next to W and seventy one. It's crazy. Yeah. So it's like they actually did come pretty close. It wasn't miles away, like you say. Um, that's funny, though. I've never heard someone say that. <laughs> but I, I, um, read, 
on Facebook, like it was one of those Facebook groups that, like yourself. I really should not go there because all it does is increase my stress levels. And the people who think they're sharing genuine information, but they're repeating, you know, seventh hand mythology, and you, you try and correct them. And, and as you know, they don't want to be corrected. They, of course, not. Like, you to say this, and you go, Well, you know, <laughs> I know, dude. Uh, it's funny, Paul. This this whole thing kind of happened, uh, getting back on the show because you and I were, were going off on this one guy a couple weeks ago. On well, Facebook. he's kind of bang up on me a little bit, didn't he? But, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. but, you know, but yeah but it was it was funny and at one point i'm just like i'm just gonna step back i'm just gonna let paul just take the reins on this one and uh because I, I knew you could you could deal with him but uh yeah you and i deal with that kind of stuff a lot and um i uh i haven't quite lost my uh you know i, I know some people who are just like whatever i don't have the energy anymore to deal with idiots like that it's like no i i still want to preach i still want to go out there and and try and get the truth out there as much as i can um but it is funny, though, like talking about this stuff. I don't know what it is. I was talking to a friend of the other day about this, you know, because like you say, there's people out there who say, oh, the bombs missed, you know, miles and land and stuff like that. People, for some reason, when it comes to World War II and like the allies in particular, they love to create these kind of myths about like everything going wrong for the Americans, it seems like there's always, you know, that you hear about the myths about the M1 ping that gets guys killed, which is BS. And, you know, you hear about, dude, I don't know what else is there. Um, I can't really think of any more off the top of my head. There, there are out there, but you always oh, hear. This drops, everybody drowning and, and all the paratroopers drowning and the floods, these kind of things that just aren't the case. I think you're absolutely right. And I think one of the things that's built up and, and the tours that I've been responsible for, my friends response, we're part of the same guilt in that we've been building up this drama by kind of having it all go wrong in in the first half of the movie right. and then kind of having it all go better in the second half of the movie. And so to build that idea of all the improvements we talk about, the breaking up the drawers and the naval gunfire coming in closer and things like that, the more you set up the the early part of the day, the more dramatic that second part of the day sounds. But what's happened is it's all got a bit out of hand. I think that's the thing, you know. And it's yeah. as we know, we're into that whole the words used like disaster and bloody Omaha. And we've talked about it a lot on World War II TV. If you go back to contemporary accounts written in 44, the news bulletins in June, July, they pretty much talked about the five beaches in the same kind of way. There wasn't this extra attention paid to the near tragedy of Omaha Beach. That is, and people can, can argue at the case if they wish, it's mostly a kind of 1980s, 1990s Ambrose, Seven Pratt Ryan video game construction that the yes. Omaha Beach was an absolute disaster. As I always say, and Colin has started saying this, and Magus says this, Omaha Beach is a successful landing that started badly. That That's, that's, that we can say that absolutely the, yes being an imp you know just doom from the beginning and everything going wrong is not quite the case no i mean and there's again you can you can look at footage and photographs where there are guys on oma and they're just like walking upright completely just moving there's there's plenty of areas along that five mile strip of beach you know omaha was long um where there wasn't like there weren't WNs in front of them, they would just go right to the shore and then they would sit there and wait. And that's usually when they eventually start getting hit by crossfire and stuff. But uh, no, there it wasn't like it, it's not like every once every landing craft hit, it wasn't like once the doors go down, just 20 machine guns opened up on them, like they always think because of movies like Saving Private Ryan and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, anywho, uh, so in terms of WN 74, yeah, it's really kind of a forgotten, neglected uh, WN along uh. Omaha, but uh, one that I hope I can find more information about in the future. But it, yeah, it was very undermanned. There wasn't a lot going on there. They had these. Uh, that that's the OP right there that uh, yeah. was that uh, was recently photographed, and uh, a very small. There's as you already know, there is an OP at WN62 that uh, Bernhard Fracking was inside, and uh, uh, you know, directing artillery and stuff like that. And that thing was eventually hit and the whole front of it's kind of annihilated now when you look at it. But I, I am guessing that it probably looked similar to this before it was hit. I, it's kind of the same look. It's kind of the same size. And um, it's kind of, it's kind of cool too. You can see where like the Germans, they would build like, co they put cobblestone and stuff along the front to kind of make it look like something other than a fortification. I don't know if that's necessarily the case here, but that's what it looks like to me. Yeah, and, and that, that will be a subject I think will come up later, is that there's a lot about the Omaha defenses that is standard straight out of the manual. You know, the, the, you know, 
same bunker types you see exactly where else they go. Then there's also this kind of stuff on Omaha, and I don't know, this is later in it where they're kind of incorporating brick and bits and pieces of stone mm-hmm. and kind of weird designs around the back. And you and you know, the thing is, there's still work to be done about who was designing this and what was happening at what level was this being done? Was it being done by company level? Was it was there some kind of overseeing architect behind Omaha Beach? I don't, I don't, we, we, these are the questions, folks, we don't have the answers to yet, you know. We, right. The reports done by the U.S. Navy and U.S. Army of some of the gun emplacements just after D-Day where they measured walls and looked at things, looked at damage. But a lot of the what I would call lesser positions like that just didn't get walked over, didn't get analyzed. And there is there is some weird building material going on there. And, you know, the people who are watching this thinking, I thought we knew everything there is to know about Omaha Beach. I thought the Allies had all these maps and everything marked out. Well, we kind of know where everything was in the terms of we know there was something in this point here and something in that point there. But exactly what was inside those bunkers and who uh, that and how thick they were, that was something we're still we're still finding out 78 years later. Yeah. And like I say, I mean. I was discovering stuff by doing photo analysis, you know, for some of these things that I'd never seen written in books ever. And we'll get into that in a yeah. little bit. Um, and also we'll bring up the fact that you, by the process of creating these images, these graphic, I don't know what you, you call them. I mean, graphics, I don't know what you, but you, by studying it to make your own image, you had to get into the weeds and look at these photos and go, so what is it behind there? And when we get to it later on, folks, you identified some features that Vida Salon says 72, particularly yes. that I've been standing in front of that for, for years. I go, nope, I didn't know that was there. And, and and I almost wanted to prove you wrong when I was looking at your images going, no, he can't have got, oh yeah, then I realized, no, no, he's got that right. No, that <laughs> he has pretty much adjusted that the way. And we'll get, we'll get to that later on, folks. Trust me, if you think you know Omaha Beach, you'll be learning some stuff during this. But yeah, the 74 so far is kind of the, the lesser known. We're still working. If there's anyone watching this who has lots of information about 74, for goodness sake, let us know because uh, <laughs> we're still we're still building our database. That's the that's the greatest thing as a histor- as, as a historian to say is I don't know because then yeah. you probably will find out. There's going to be someone who steps forward. And I that's my best way of learning something is say, I don't know this. Let me share it with the world, and then someone like yourself or so like will come along and tell me something that I didn't know. Uh, admitting that you don't know is one of the best things you can do, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so let me scroll through some more of these. Let's see. That's so you saw that. Oh, that's a famous photo. You see that a lot. This kind of shows some of the gun pits at uh, seventy four. These just real basic kind of dugouts with these uh, camo umbrellas over them. And uh, no real fortification at all. And I believe these were all Skoda, like 75 millimeter Skoda guns. I don't think they're, these were like, you know, German packs or anything like that. Um, and one's destroyed right here. And uh, so this was, this might have been one that was hit by the naval bombardment, not the, uh, mm. not the bombers per se. Um, because I do know that the naval bombardment was a bit more successful than the bombers were. Um and it's it probably what a lot of this is over here as well. All of this stuff that's scattered about. But uh, okay, let's see. Okay, that's inside the uh, the OP bunker. And also going with Saving Private Ryan and this specific type of uh, you know uh, fortification here. These were not machine gun bunkers. These are observation posts. You know, you could technically put a machine gun inside it, but that's not what they were intended for. Yeah, um, that's more of seventy four. Yeah, it's the same photo. So that's one of the gun pits right here. I believe that's a Skoda gun. I'm not. Uh, yeah, yeah. And there's another photo of that same Skoda gun, I think, that I've seen in numerous books illustrating WN60, WN64. I've seen it flipped representing 65. It's, yep. it's one of the photos that does the rounds. And I think for years I wasn't sure at which one it was taken myself. But I think we now are pretty certain that it is 74. I mean, there's, if you, have you got the other image as well, the one of the. Of the it's, I think it's one guy with the with the gun, isn't it? I think, if my memory serves. That one? The one. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure people watching, they've seen that illustrating pretty much every defense from the west to the east of Omaha. But we're, 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 we're pretty certain it's 74, aren't we? Yeah, it is. I, I, I'm more than certain after, like, looking at this and then comparing it to, you know, like, these photos right here. Like, it has to be that, that one right there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. see that support beam right there? Yeah. That's that right there. Yeah, yeah, no, so. definitely. And that's the kind of stuff that you have to do when you're in photo analysis, you know, looking at certain things like that. But uh, it's kind of interesting to see how these are. I mean, yeah, it's just a, uh, it's just logs stacked on top with like sheet metal, uh, corrugated sheet metal in here. You know, real basic stuff. People usually, when they think of uh, 
the Atlantic wall, they think of like these concrete monoliths and stuff like that. And that's just not the case. There was a lot of under underpowered, undermanned, under equipped uh, WNs along that the whole thing. Well, I mean, that's what, and that's worth taking apart that idea for a minute, Michael, because again, there's all these books and things with all the photos, Atlantic wall talking about the much vaunted, the feared. look at the concrete. They use photos of the U-boat pen, things like that. And you go, yeah. well, my response to that is, if it was so good, how come it fell in less than a few hours on nearly everywhere where we landed? Yeah, That's it, true. You know, if it was so bloody good, why did it not hold out? Why? And as you say, a lot of it was unfinished, uh, um, shoddy materials, shoddy concrete, shoddy construction, uh, and and just just not not substantial enough for the for the weight of the Allied guns that came in it. As James Holland talks, yeah, you know, there's. 288s on the whole of Omar, and I think it was 112 naval guns of that or greater caliber bombarding it that day. I mean, it, it, it wasn't enough. If it had been enough, they might have stopped the Allies, but it clearly wasn't enough. So yeah. talking about all the, the, how great the Atlantic War was is just, in many ways, it's ridiculous. It was just a huge expense of money that ultimately worked for, for half a morning. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a total myth. It's a total myth. And um that's the the funny thing about it. like when you do see photos that people like to you know love to really build up and stuff like that it's usually of like battery tote and stuff like that you know it's stuff yeah, exactly. that didn't stuff that didn't see any action at all you know stuff that was uh bypassed or something like that and uh these tarpon nests were the ones that you know really got hit and um i do like with a lot of these too and this is another thing that movies really get wrong is that they you never see like camouflage or anything like that in movies. And these, all of these would have been camouflaged. I mean, you see remnants of a net right here hanging down. And uh, so like on D-Day, this whole thing would have probably, and that's what probably these bars are for right yeah, here. They're yeah. drilled into that log. And uh, this would have had a net over it and it probably would have only come up when they were going to fire it. Um, and we'll get more into that as we look through more photos. But uh, yeah, there's the OP. I just I found this one so cool that I just collected every photo I could find on it because I'd never seen it listed on any map or anything. So yeah. very, very awesome. All right. And that's all I got for 74. It's yeah, it's it's a very kind of unknown nest, but as you, and as you can see, it's pretty damn far away from this is V this is the D1 draw right over here. It's pretty far. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it, and you wonder why, in terms of the German numbering, it, it, why it was included as part of the Stuttgart because it is that much further away. I mean, seventy isn't that much is is closer to the to the to the east than than seventy four is. But you know, why they didn't just have the three anyway? Whatever, that's their yeah. the German system. I mean, but anyway, that's that's seventy four. So should we move along to seventy three? Yes, please. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, give it off to you. For you can yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the um, well, here, here, folks, is just a bit of film from kind of the, the lower part of WN73. So we are facing uh, to the east now. This is the view. I mean, what we can say the bunkers may not have been substantial, but the fields of fire were, were often pretty, pretty incredible. That's the thing that was the, the Germans had got it right because mm -hmm. how would you get it wrong in, in that kind of location with a with a with a concave beach? How could you not get your defenses set up to pro provide such incredible angles? But that that that's the lower position at 73. And then we'll we'll turn to some of your 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 photos in a minute. So um yeah, the view, well, it's it, it speaks for itself, but you can you can see right the way down the beach there. Um, it's a good it's, it's a great firing position, yes. Yeah. And one thing also that many people don't know, like today, obviously, and I think it's been this way for a long time, uh, there's that, you can see it right there in that video, there's that path that comes up and it passes by that uh, casemate. Uh, that wasn't there on D-Day, that whole thing, there was no access to get up that. It's just, it just stopped right at the foot of that bunker. So that uh, whole, like, people usually think that that's the way that uh, uh, Garanson and his rangers went up. That's That's not at all where they went up. No, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that and then I'll, I'll show you from inside the the opening. So I'll put I'll just let this video run its course. Got a few seconds to go because above this there are more to position. I'll let you run through the details. What was there? There's more to positions. There's another observation position. There's other weaponry as well. And a part of part of seventy three is is overgrown, and part of it on the very edge of the cliff is is probably gone. Uh, but um, I'll I'll put up the, the slot and you can tell us what we're looking at here. So this is inside one of the bunkers there. So yes, explain what we're yes. looking at. 
That is inside one of the uh, the what, I forgot the the correct number, but it's uh, there. The, there's two mortar toe bricks on the very top, and they're they're big ones. And that is an observation slit right next to one of them. That's built into a cobblestone wall that wraps around the entire property on the top of the escarpment up there. And you can still it's still visible today. Obviously, Paul has his footage of it, but uh, you can really see it in photos. This it's this like rectangular embrasure and this is where a lot of fire control and stuff would be they have an entire view of the beach and they could just turn to the mortar guy right next to him and say okay give you know fire on this right here so it's a it's a really great uh point of view you know there we go and, and the mortar emplacement so i'm going to freeze frame it in a minute there this is again from two or three years ago this footage and it's really really hard to get into now it's so overgrown the entrance is not very good there but i'm going to freeze frame it in a minute because there's a really cool bit of still, there we go. That is German graffiti from 44 in pencil. And I've had people who understand German. And it's some kind of tally of what they've got in there. It's kind of a list of stuff. It's very hard to read the words and things like that. But it's got some quantities there. So presumably some guy is offloading fuses, mortars, mortar shells, whatever it would be, and is making a little running total there of what he's got there. But because this is a bunker that the general public can't get into, it's amazing that it's still it's it's still visible. And as I can keep playing it, you'll you'll see as we go inside the mortar embracement, you can still see all around the inside of the octagonal opening of the mortar. And it, I should point out for there's now a concrete slab over the top of it where the mortar right. would actually fire out of. But because there's been a concrete slab since I don't know what the 1950s the watercolor paintings that were the range uh, indicators are still visible there. Pretty much every bunker near the beaches would have had some kind of improvised painted view of what the bunker is looking at with ranges marked out on it. So key object, key, key targets located. And most of the bunkers, they have faded away. that You cannot see them at all. But here you can see them. And it will, the video carries on and gets up into it in a minute. And um yeah, it's a, it's, as Colin said, it's a, it's a stock list of what's in the positions there. And you can see there the recesses inside the wall there for the, for the keeping of the ammunition. Yep. Uh, the actual mount for the mortar has pretty much gone. And I'll let, I'll let Michael carry on talking in a minute because you've done a lot of work on, on the, 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 the actual types of bunkers and what's in there. But it carries on in a minute, and you'll see these watercolor paintings. So, folks, if you've never seen this kind of stuff before, it is really cool. Um, that, that's what we're talking about. There's a photo. Have you got the wartime photo there, Michael, of that, of, 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 of a mortar? We can bring it up in a minute, not necessarily right now. I do. Let me, uh, let me uh, pull it up. I know which one you're talking about. Um, but that, that is the, that's the inside there, folks. So, um, and often if you take someone like Chris Beck, I know that's a big naval gun battery, but they would target the letters all had a code name beginning with letter O's. There's Odin and Obear and things like that. So they would have, each position would have some kind of shorthand as the fire on target giraffe or fire on target target lion, whatever it would be. So they can bring down that information really quickly. Usually and, um, women's names, yeah, or something like that. Yeah, women's names, whatever it would be, the names of their pets and uh, so we'll just we'll let that play out. Then I'll let Michael show his wartime images. And um, folks, this is the kind of thing that if you live in Normandy, these are the kind of there we are. You can see the paintings really clearly there. You can see the, that's the really example cool. lettering there, and that that's kind of a view with the grassy bit and the view there. And they they're, they're all round inside this particular one. So I hope you're enjoying um, looking at that, folks. Yeah, that's uh, that, and and you know. It's kind of cool. The fact that they put whatever a concrete piece over it has kind of preserved a lot of it, which is really yeah. cool. And uh, otherwise, it just would have been washed away. Um, but yeah, that type of uh, that type of tow brook is called a uh, IC one twenty five. IC one twenty five, and it's a uh, it's a large mortar tow brook. Like most machine gun tow brooks are pretty small. These ones are large. And uh, when you look at uh, like this, the whole um, what's it called? Like the blueprint of them. You can see that area that you were just showing that has that pencil writing it. That's usually where they would like store like different types of ammunition. They would store maybe even a spare mortar if they had to replace it. Uh, it it's much bigger than a regular uh, like machine gun tow brook. And uh, the WN73 had two of them on the very top there. But uh, that's so cool with the range indicators. Like, I mean, it's that was something when I was re researching. Uh, see, there we go. There's the blueprint of it right there. That area that Paul was showing that had the pencil in it was like this right in here. Um, and these right here would have the range indicators all above it. Those are the ammunition storages right there. This is the entrance right here. Very narrow, you know, it's, it's very small in terms of like the inside. You can tell it's not a, not a grand hallway or anything. Um, 
but uh oh what was i what was i saying um uh in terms of like yeah tow brooks though this one is very is much larger because it fired a, had a much like bigger mortar on it and everything like that and um i i look like the the actual like uh pillar on the inside isn't there anymore that the mortar would sit on it's been broken exactly. off yeah. uh, but that was that was usually the case they would have the the mortar that would fasten to it and then they you know and then they would just be able to know but based on those those cards that are all around it you know where what is what where such and such is and uh, here's a photo taken not long after d-day uh facing the west and that's that tow brook that uh paul was just showing and there you can actually see the uh range identi uh, uh, identity things much clearer right there you can see numbers written on them and stuff like that they'd usually take like a piece of chalk or a grease pen or something and mark different like things on it what you know where they would know what the specific um coordinates are that they need to dial in for that specific area so they don't have to do any kind of back and forth between the forward observer or anything uh kind of a cool uh you know a, a cool way of uh of doing it really it's it's uh it's pretty cool and genius and delco is asking about the i mean don't know the answer is whether they hired painters or the painters were enlisted german soldiers. i mean i do know around omaha beach they do seem to have a similar style so either there was someone within either the 352nd or one of the static divisions who was going around painting to order or that or they had engaged someone again this is another question that we haven't got an answer to but there, there is uh, there's a heimdall book about graffiti in german bunkers which is interesting but it doesn't cover the uh, the use of them for marking so it's again an under under investigated area but i i mean i'm assuming that it was it was probably some guy because you wouldn't get a local to do it because you wouldn't want him to know the information so i'm assuming it's someone within the german military who you know hands up who can do a painting i suppose was the uh hands oh, up who does watercolors right i i'm sure it was or someone from organization tote or something you know there's someone that could they do they do because you're right like i've seen all of the uh the range images inside you know all the bunkers and they do all have they, they seem like they use the same colors and stuff like that and they all have kind of a blue uh, border around them so uh it is interesting there are some that i've seen on other parts along normandy where they actually would have photographs like taped to the wall they would they would actually be able they had like access to a camera or something and they would have photographs they wouldn't have to worry about doing the paintings so yeah no definitely i mean it's it's it, it is it there's a lot of work has gone into this but as well you know, as people know what the idea behind the bunk the not the mortars so much but the the, the weapon refiring and enfilading down the beach is that you've got all your pre-ranged targets in place but of course it, they only work for that limited time when the enemy force is on the beach you can't get the navy or the, the, the landing craft on their way in or once they're off the beach in the bluffs you can't get them in so it's a it's a narrow window of opportunity the Germans had, and as when when the troops were off the landing beaches quickly, so for example, sword were relatively relatively quickly off the beaches, the defenses there just don't get a time to uh, to to work effectively. Although COD did take some time to to take, of course. But I'll hand it back to you and go through some of your photos of seventy three, and we can carry on this conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me uh, see what all I got pulled up here. I I, I have so many photos and everything we, we love the fact you've got so many it's cool <laughs> uh oh okay so this this is uh this is the main casemate of uh wn73 and before i get into this gun and stuff like here let's go back to uh let's see let's go back to the very beginning right here um i know so much stuff um so this is that uh this is that, that the main casemate of wn73 which i find to be really interesting because it does not look like any other casemate along Omaha or really any other one that I know of uh, in the area, like in Grand Comp or anything like that. It is very um, improvised and clearly a uh, special construction. It's not a, it doesn't ad adhere to any of the like, you know, uh, bow, uh, uh, what's it called? Regal bow or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And um, this one right here, if I go to a uh, broader photo of WN73, here we go. This is looking, this is from WN72. And if we zoom in, we can really see. There it is right there. And this photo really shows, too, that that path that uh, exists today did not exist. Yeah, you know? exactly. And you can see, like, the pickets right here where the uh, the concertina wire would have just come right through this. And the, the cannon probably shot through it when they were firing. Um, now, 
I, uh, I find it, again, I find it interesting because it's just unlike any other structure that you see along Omaha, but it's one of the most, more prominent ones. I mean, today people pass by it all the time and that, you know, I see it posted on Facebook and on Google and stuff like that a lot. But uh, it uh, obviously in traditional German style, it is facing along the beach and not out to sea, which is, you know, very smart. We can get more into that as we look into stuff around 72. But uh, let's see, we go through all this crap. Here's a closer photo of it right here. And unfortunately, I've never found a really HD, real HD version of this photo, which sucks because it has some really cool stuff in it that you can tell. Uh, there's the bunker right there or the casemate, you know, the, 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 the fortification housing the artillery gun. And um, you can see remnants of concertina wires, uh, you know, strands sitting over here. You can tell it's German because there's a barb like every inch or something like that. Um, and down here is something that still is debated. I, I don't know what the hell this is, but in front of this casemate, there is some kind of, you know, hooded structure, you know, like foxhole or something right here. And I, I've seen a, a lot of people say that that has to be a machine gun position, which I don't agree with. What I think it might be is some kind of observation position that once a battle started, maybe the guys would have pulled back out of it, but like they maybe have observed before there was a, there, you know, the fighting really started because no one can occupy this thing with a 75 millimeter cannon at the, you know, right at the back of your head. I mean, once that thing goes off, it's going to blow whoever is right here. It's going to blow their eardrums out. And could, the concussion could even kill them. I mean, it's really powerful. So it doesn't make any sense that there would be any kind of position in front of an embrasure of a casemate. But I honestly don't know. What are your thoughts on that, Paul? I don't know. I mean, the only thing I know is we took um, a veteran whose name, Mag just said his name in the sideburn. I've completely forgotten his name. He died last year. He's one of the surviving men of the 116th. But he, his objective, and we kind of worked it out, was he was a flamethrower operator. And his objective was whatever it was, was underneath the 75. So he, he was specifically tasked with going for that empty thing. Mm. But he didn't remember what it was what it was that he was supposed to be taking out, other than the fact he was meant to be using a flamethrower on it. So that I don't think I think it just muddies the water a little bit. Russell Pickett <laughs> is the gentleman's name. Right. And again, the photo is too grainy and too, you know, not high res enough to see what the hell this is exactly. I even like said, who knows, maybe it's something the Americans put there afterwards. But now that you've told me that, I don't think that's the case. It has no, I, th I think it was there before. I, I, okay. I'm pretty, I, I, I do. I do believe that. But what it was, I don't know. I mean, was it something were they digging out to put the gun down in a better bunker? Was it was it the early bunker that a gun had been in and they moved it up? Because you do see that other positions where there's the first type of uh, construction they put something in and then they upgrade and they move it somewhere else. So maybe that was the previous position for that. But then that doesn't really make sense because why if you've got it down low dug in, why would you then put it above? It, it doesn't that doesn't make sense. So I, I, unless there's some threat of of erosion or something who knows yeah but uh it's a uh, it's it's a very odd thing but uh the the actual case made itself uh, that's a good point though by the way I, i've never heard that theory so that that could be that could be a uh the and a couple of other people gary has said it maps it was built uh, then abandoned when the upper one was built so that's a couple of people on the sidebar have suggested that is a possibility that it is an earlier phase of construction that then got phased out when they they went for the final design. But yeah, if anyone has got an, a, a high definition version of that photo, it, 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 I, it's in some books, but always very grainy. Yes. So um, yeah. I would love to know as well. But uh, so the actual casemate though, you know, housing this right here, and it looks like it fell off the wheels or something. This is a, um, it's a, it's a, a, it's a French gun. And um, it is, a, I believe it's known as PAC, a PAC 9738, if I remember right and uh 50 millimeter i believe and um very interesting because it has this kind of weird non-german looking muzzle break at the end here um but this is what this casemate would have housed and it probably fired a lot on d-day and uh i'm not sure if it was you know exactly hit by something or what but it seems to have fallen completely off its carriage right here in this photo and now it's kind of being propped up by some stones um What's really interesting about this, and you're going to see this in other photos that we look at in the W1s uh, to come at Stutzpunch Beerville, is that if you look at the barrel right here, it has these brackets at the very end of it, which is like I'm, when I first started studying this stuff, I was like, what the hell is that? Because I noticed it on nearly every gun barrel 
um, in Stützpunkt Vierville, except for those Skoda guns at 74 and stuff like that. But I was like, what the hell is that? And I figured out what it is. It is a it is for mounting a MG34 on the barrel to use as a training aid for people for when you're training and you'd fire around you exactly what you'd fire at one tracer and you'd be able to see where the gun is shooting exactly. And uh, now am I, is, am I getting that right, Paul? That's, that's kind of what I've learned. Yeah, no, I think so. Yeah. I mean, Gary pointed out it's a 75, not a 50. Okay. Okay. Sorry. 75. Sorry. I got that wrong. Um, but, you know, and when when you came up with the idea of the MG34, and I and I and you and I looked into it, and it was something they had done elsewhere, but it's the only place around Omaha I'd seen them doing it there. So again, it's exactly who was getting that done and whether that was done universally in Normandy doesn't seem to be the case. But that was obviously a sighting, a, a sighting um, addition that they were using in this in this position, which is which is it's just interesting. I said, folks, yeah. we may not be providing the answers to everything in this show. It's just as I said at the beginning, it's kind of a free for free for all uh, discussion about where we are currently with the thinking about some of these defenses. Yeah, yeah, um, and it's funny that that whole thing when I when I discovered that I discovered that it's a real like niche thing. Like I don't, I've never seen anyone really talk about that the Germans doing that, but I've been able to unearth photos where they would have an MG34 strapped to the barrel of like a, you know, a pack gun. So it's a, uh, it's really interesting. Now was, was the MG34 there on D-Day? Probably not because it's a training device, but still it's a cool, it's a cool thing to, uh, to learn about. You know, you never really hear anyone talking about that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't imagine they would have enough MG34 to leave one on every one of the weapons that they had these brackets on. It's something they're going to move the weapon around as right. they're setting it up, as they're training, because as we know, another whole rabbit hole of a conversation about exactly what machine guns were along Omaha Beach. Some people say it was all MG42s. Some say it was no MG42s. It is limited numbers of MG42s with lots and lots of foreign stuff is basically an and old, older marks. But mm -hmm. they hadn't got enough MG34s to just lie, use them simply for sighting of the larger weapons. It would be right. it would, ridiculous. See, this is a thing that I imagine, though, as a filmmaker, like if you told... A filmmaker about this like they would say that's it we're putting machine guns on every german gun barrel in the movie you know like it's a very kind of cool you know thing to to consider i could definitely see movies taking advantage of that mm -hmm. um so uh scroll to see that's a blueprint of that bunker right there and you can see the uh the pack in there um very interesting design uh from you know I, i've never seen another one that kind of looks like that with this trapezoid shape um, apparently this hole in the roof, uh, is for ventilation for, with the, the gun, you know, with the, the fumes coming out of it and everything. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's stood the test of time. It's, it's all really intact, you know, uh, to this day, it's, uh, you can, you can go walk through it and everything like that. None of it's really crumbled around it or anything. So, but, um, also, uh, what's kind of interesting about it too, if we go back to, you know, uh, let's see your photo of you know, close up. Um, it's not solid concrete. It's made with uh, cinder blocks. And um, that's something that you see a lot around here is that there's this kind of mishmash between solid reinforced concrete and then like reinforced cinder blocks with concrete kind of mashed into it. Um, a very... Uh, you know, a, a substitute, as it were, for yeah, the solid yeah. concrete. Yeah. The, the rule, the rule of thumb I use: if it's all shuttered poured concrete, it's early 42, 43. If it's a mixture of shuttered <laughs> poured concrete and cinder block blocks, it's mid era. And if it's just the blocks, it's kind of late 1944. And you can see that, you know, you look at the new bunk bunkers that are being built at Point du Hot, we discussed it with Steve Zaloga, the yeah. new ones all being made of the block type. The earlier ones are the poured cast concrete. And it's simply because, folks, if we didn't catch this on an earlier show, the Germans were having huge problems getting the wood to the coast to use to make the bunkers because of the bombing of the railway lines and wood being flammable. So they're having to resort to the, the block technique done on site because of the wood um, uh, the wood problems. So that's why if, you, if you're walking around Vida Snonsis in Normandy and you see the block technique primarily, it is a later one, 44. And if you see the poured concrete, it's an earlier one, 42 or 43. It's not an right. exact science, but it's pretty, it's pretty effective. Right. And um, along Omaha, there were a number of casemates that were still under construction and every single one of them was being done with the block technique. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. 
you weren't even doing that. Oh, so Leslie is adding that the gun is a combination of a barrel from a French Canon 75 model 1897 fitted with a Swiss solid third muzzle brake on the carriage of the German 5 centimeter pack 38 and could fire captured French and Polish ammo. So there, thank you very much for that, Leslie, is an example of just the hodgepodge of stuff the Germans are using by 1944. This, as we said earlier, this idea, this much vaunted, full of tech Atlantic wall is, is really a, a, a myth. It is anything they've got cobbled together from stuff they've captured, purloined, borrowed, found, dug up and acquired, all hastily put together. So thanks for that. It was great, great detail, Leslie. Exactly, yes. And uh, that, that is one thing that I, I find, again, I find that, that aspect of it way more interesting than the fact that if they had just, you know, the best the best stuff around you know it's like uh so i, I always find that the, the the booty weapons and stuff like that to be really interesting um so anything else about 73 we want to say yeah yeah so these are some uh some uh, uh reconnaissance photos taken in may of 1944 uh right before d-day and uh you can really see uh the you can see the 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 mansion right here and on 73 this is worth mentioning there was a giant manor house uh called the the gambier uh i believe that's my way of pronouncing it i don't know if it's, it's right or not but yeah. uh it was there for a long time i think it was like built in the early like 19 teens or something and uh it was there on d-day and the americans uh referred to it as a fortified house but i don't think the germans had fortified it in any way i think it was just sitting in in the wn and um I don't think they utilized it in any way. They might have used it for some observation well, or something they, like that. They built a little barrack bit behind it. So I think okay. I think when they call about it fortified, it's the position that got increased to become fortified, but not the house itself. And somewhere on my hard drive, I've got some footage of me and my mate Sean going through the barrack block behind it. It's all what was left of the house has pretty much collapsed away now. The whole area is really dangerous to get to. But yeah. The house itself, I don't think they did much to. They did build this block behind it. Now, who who was living in there or using that and where they were going to? I'm guessing they're moving uh, east towards 73. It was accommodation for there, I suppose. But, yeah, the fortified, I think, refers to I'm, – I'm guessing the barrack block could have housed about 20 guys, something like that, and it was kind of built in – behind the house uh whether it shows up on the aerial photos have you got an aerial photo of that michael i, I do in fact let me uh i got to i got something really cool let me show you uh... and people are loving the show by the way this is this is uh, it, it's a bit more free from this photo this this show but it's just it's two guys just all discussing german concrete it's, uh, we're, it's awesome we're, you know we're, we're we're fulfilling our addiction in a public forum it's like it's like it's like some kind of self-help group isn't it we're sitting around <laughs> talking about our addiction in front of other people who have the same addiction it's a it's, the first step is admitting you've got a problem isn't it exactly that's what i said there's nothing better than admitting that you don't know so uh yeah. and then you'll you'll learn something from that but let me explain a little bit about this so these are aerial photos from a sortie taken at 8 a.m on d-day now i met i photoshopped them i blended them all together to make one big long swoop of of uh stutzput vierville as far as i could make out that unfortunately it didn't catch wn 74 it went to the to the it kind of went to the to south here as the as the plane went on but uh, you can see even the numbers of of each frame and uh you know so but I, I blended them all together and it's it's all super hd stuff and i have this version and then i made a labeled version that has everything listed out so we can switch between these if we want to but uh if we're going to go to wn 73 here is the Gambier, the Gambier, or whatever you say. That's this house right here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the block is that bit to the right, then that the 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 the, the vertical rectangle. That must be the that must be the block house, then. Yeah. Okay. So for, um, from what I've observed, like here, let me see if I can switch back. That vertical one is this thing right here. Yeah. Maybe so, not there. Maybe is there is there something in between that and the. There's okay. another fainter rectangle. Oh, yeah, that L shape. It was that then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that's what that is. I think I even listed that on my here. Here's my labeled version. Yeah, I did that because the red are German position, the blue are French. Yeah. Houses okay. So it's, it's the red there. So I've got, I've got a photo of that somewhere. In fact, while you're talking, I'll see if I can find that because I might have that somewhere. Um, this is cool. this is good stuff. So we're just having this um free fall photo uh so discussion. So yeah, keep on talking about seventy three and what you found, and I have a little look. 
Cool. Yeah, there are a lot of ammunition storages and such along 73 that are still there today. That's what like these kind of clustered rectangles are. There's a number of them for some reason along there. Here are the two, uh, those two mortar tow brooks, the two red guys right there. And uh, this right here, this blue, that is the wall that protected this one right here that had that uh, observation slit that uh, Paul just showed. And I kind of made this little rectangle right here as a possible kind of cavity in there as to where the observation would be. And on D-Day, this wall collapsed, uh, which is why this big thing is filled in right here. So this was a big wall that wrapped around in this, uh, you know, round, rounded kind of L shape. And it collapsed in front of the Tobruk right here. In fact, I have a photo of that. Let me pull that up. Uh, that you can really see in a second please um and it was again it was, it's just looking at a lot of this stuff being like what is that exactly okay here we go see at the very top here that embrasure or not it's not an embrasure that kind of the aperture that observation thing that paul showed at the beginning when we start, first started talking about 73 that's this right here that's that that opening right there that he was looking out of now the wall at some point collapsed and you can see this right here all of that fell over now who knows what it was maybe it was the naval fire that was close by caused it to you know ripple so much that it fell over maybe it was hit by something who knows i haven't found any kind of proof as to what knocked this down but you can tell that's a bunch of rubble and on the overhead that was taken at 8 a.m that's definitely what this is right here just for a second i'm showing my picture of that that that's my old photo from years ago of the uh of that building that l shape oh. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, that's that's how I've seen those those things up there on WN73. They got these like you know square shaped windows everywhere. So uh, back up again. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that cool. was just a show what that was. Very cool. So yeah, as like I said, the blue indicates you know French structures and stuff like that. So this right here, that wall with the the mortar tow brook is right up here, and that's where that wall collapsed. That's what this is right here on D Day at eight a.m. So I'm guessing that at eight a.m. that the Americans really hadn't you know. They hadn't started to attack a lot. I mean, I guess they had, but uh, I'm guessing that wall fell over due to probably the naval bombardments. And here is the uh, the unmarked version. You can see that big white spot there. That has to be that collapsed wall that yeah. we see right there. That's just what I've gathered from my own observation. Yeah, no, and this is this is brilliant stuff. And 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 I'm glad you mentioned earlier about the fact that the route Goranson took with his rangers can't have been the path up behind 73 past 70 because it didn't exist. So. Uh, I mean, we know they they were they were cliff trains, so it has to be further to the west, up or directly up the cliff, cliffs, kind of in from the back there. But uh, so I've I've seen people, tour guides, documentaries walking up that path, saying this is where Goranson went as well. No, no, yeah, he couldn't have gone up this. Well, for one, he wasn't, you know, he didn't land in this area. He was way more over here. Oops, he was way more, like you say, over in this area right here. Yeah. And this was this is all concertina wire here. I mean, that would have been terrible to, and there would have been Germans in this already. So yeah, that would have been terrible to try and get through that. Um, now, what's kind of an interesting thing about seventy three is that I've never really seen a lot of stuff in terms of machine gun nests and stuff. That's a photo of the Gambier house taken in the nineteen like nineteen thirty, I believe, um, when it was under construction. Um, really good photo. Uh, I haven't got that one, so you have to send me that one because I've got a much crappier version of that. But yeah, it's good. I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, and uh, this is on top of seventy three. This is looking towards the Gambier. That's that uh, vertical building we're talking. Those are some of those things Paul was just showing right there. Um, different types of ones that have that same kind of structure to them. Um, and some of the trenches are still there. Those zigzag trenches are still there, but they right. are so overgrown. You can kind of vaguely make them out in the winter, uh, but the caravan park has kind of gone over it now. There's now lots of fences because the, cl the cliffs are subsiding. So some of the stuff I was doing even five years ago, you can't do anymore, and it's getting more and more of the cliff is falling away. But th there were these trench the outlines of these trenches still remaining there. So there was a lot to see a few years ago. Right, exactly. You can see them right here. And uh, they, again, they they were not uh, they were not really long. You know, they're not really wide. I mean, or anything like that. Really deep. They were very narrow. You kind of have to you know huddle when you run through them. Um, and th this is again showing that wall right here, and that's that aperture for observation right there, and uh, fire control. And the mortar would have been right up in this area. Um, that's looking. Let's see, east. This is all. There's the Gambier right there. This is probably yeah, that's the photo I've got. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's, yeah. It's probably like you know early 30s. Um, that's another one of it. 
That's taken from the SK at WN72. You can see part of the wall right there. Um, more of that. So this is a cool one because you can see a lot of the remnants of those trenches you were just talking about. Yeah, yeah. And they're kind of still there, I say, but they're overgrown with this. Yeah, I don't know what it is. People stuff. It's kind of almost like a bamboo kind of stuff in them. We get thick, kind of not wood, but kind of hollow kind of stuff, and it gets really, really difficult to move through. It's like kind of jungle warfare there. And <laughs> this time in the summer, you can't get anywhere near it. I so say you have you have to approach from the top now because they've barbed put all kind of uh, barbed wire around the back of the uh, the seventy five millimeter casemate now. So you can't come from the path. You have to kind of go from the top. Which means going all the way around the carrot round park, kind of using the fields. It's a real, real rigmarole. rigmarole. But um, yeah, there, there is still some stuff there. But um, yeah, fascinating stuff. Now, this photo right here, what's really cool about it is that Leslie, so you'll be very helpful. Japanese knotweed is the stuff I'm talking about, apparently. There we are. <laughs> See, we just learned something. Um, uh, so, so if we go back to this, the aerial right here, you'll see on 73, there's like along the trench you'll see this U shape right here. And I was kind of wondering, what is that? Is that a machine gun position? You see a couple of, you see another U shape over here. If you go all the way over to WN71, you'll see a couple of these U shape uh, positions along the trenches and stuff, if you really look. And uh, and I marked them even on this one right here. Yeah, you can see there's the U shape right there. And uh, and I noticed in this, this photo, you can see it right here. That's it yeah. right there. And it has corrugated sheet metal along it. Uh, along the wall right there to keep it intact. Now, I'm is that a machine gun position that it could swivel, you know, uh, uh, 180 degrees? Like, I don't know what exactly that is. I don't know. Uh, yeah. It could be. Um, I mean, it, you, you're going beyond my level of information now, which is, which is, I have to say, I'm loving it. Because, and I'm sure the other people who are watching this who think themselves quite knowledgeable in Omaha are now going, yep, no, I've never <laughs> known this before. So it, it has to be for a kind of a, uh, an infantry type weapon so it's something that's portable isn't it so it's some kind of ma machine gun or something they can move around or or and we can't just be for rifles i mean it's been now reminding me about the guys those hell he let loose kind of video games that have lots yeah. of trees with shattering and stuff in them which i've always been saying aren't very authentic but then actually now they they are maybe a bit more authentic by accident than they are but yeah i can only think it's some kind of ability to move a to, to swing a machine gun around over a, over a wider area, I suppose. Right, um, yeah, because if you had a machine gun, you know, fixed on this this uh, semicircle right here, you could easily traverse, like, you know, you have this wide angle of fire uh, and just be moving along this trench right here, you know, back and forth. But John's had... Vader, who knows his stuff, he's saying it is for an MG, for an, an MG. So if okay. John, and John joins in some of our discussions on Facebook, so he's another... So if John, if you've got anything to support that, and not, I'm not saying I doubt you, John, because John is another one of those people who studies aerial photos. So John knows what he's talking about. So thank you for joining us, John. But um, if you can add what your conclusion is for saying it's a machine gun, that would be really gratefully appreciated. Yeah. We want to know. That's why it's, yeah, it's not uh, doubting it. We just, we want to know. <laughs> but uh, and I think you can see it in some other photos. Yeah, here's another one right here. You can see it again. And again, that corrugated sheet metal. And even in the previous photo, you can see some of the sheet metal sitting on top of there where I yeah. was discarded or whatever. Um, really cool. Yeah, these, it's just so funny. The trenches, they're so narrow and just, you know, they're they are not like how movies like to show with, the, you know, they're really wide with, you know, wood and stuff like that lining them. Well, um, that's because movies have to have them big enough. You know this because you're they have to have them big enough to track a camera. To move down. a camera down. Yeah, that's that's the problem with it. Or thing is that is that they in order to do the, get the shot they want to recreate you have you have to have a, a you know a, tr a, a tracks and a cameraman and a sound man and the grip and stuff all rolling back there so trenches are always too wide in world war ii movies that's true well and you know that's the big problem with world war one movies too is that you know every yeah. world war one movie the trenches you know it's they're really wide this it's the same thing yeah it's it's because they have to move cameras and people and i love they... these rabbit holes we're going down it's fantastic stuff so um <laughs> right yeah. So this is another one looking uh, looking at WN73 from WN72's position. Now, what's cool about this is that you can actually see the remnants of the concertina wire. You can see where it kind of, in two lines, wraps around the, the shingle right here and converges into one that continues up the escarpment right here. That's pretty cool. Um, there's no kind of – on the uh, down below uh, W73, there's no kind of seawall or anything like that um it's just the cliff that's where the cliffs really start to uh, you know become a thing on omaha is on this section right here um yeah. 
No, that's yeah. that's a great detail about the concertina wire there. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I um do through maps and photos uh, and these photos. That's what the green is on on this right here. The the green is where the concertina wire was, and that area I was just talking about. That's where it converges into one right there and continues wow. going up. Yeah, and. Uh, it's funny, actually, the trenches of 72 and 73, I believe, were a bit more connected than we think. I, from observing this photo, the orange are the trenches, by the way. From observing yeah. this photo, they really seem to kind of merge into each other. This is 72, part of 72 right here. Um, so that's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, yeah, 73, it's uh, it's another one that uh, it's a bit more vague. Um, not a whole lot is known. It's kind of it's kind of sometimes talked about a lot because it has, you know, like the, the Gambier house and stuff like that. Um, and it has that. That's the uh, the 75 millimeter uh, casemate right there. Um, so that's that. It is it is uh, you know talked about sometimes, but uh, well, it's a go ahead. Yeah, I mean the thing is, what we do is we talk about the stuff we easily see that that, that, that and that's where history has gone the way of of over the last 50, 60 years. What has been visible of that? Obviously, that that one bunker there with the with the you know, with the, they had the French 75 in it and the, the 45 house. They have been the two bits that have been obvious. So that's the bits we've people have been talking about. What and yet you the, the investigation as to what's behind it because it became overgrown and things like that. It's just been kind of left to not been done. And and you know, at the end of the day, whether you're a tour guide or a historian, how much time do you have to spend detailing every single Vida Stones nest? Because you know, <laughs> you, you there are books on entire entire single Vita Stones. There's the book on the Vita Stones at 62 by um, uh, the, the, the German author. Heinrich um, Severlo. So, yeah. So, you know, um, yeah. How much time do you get down in the weeds? Quite literally here. But, um, yeah, fantastic <laughs> stuff. Um, yeah, well, I, I've never been to Omaha or anything, so it's like it's a lifelong goal of mine to act, finally go there and actually tread along all this stuff that I've been well, doing. Matt Magley is saying, incredible that you are able to visualize the place without being here, being there. Hope you can come over soon. And, and so, um, that yeah, we'll, we'll have to make sure we can do that. You and JD who's watching, go around there and, and, and Colin with a, you know, a, a pair of um, some machete blades and some <laughs> um, gloves and just get to grips with it. But yeah, I thought we should move on to 72 a bit by now. Yes. Otherwise here all night exactly it's, yes but bad. Absolutely. yes absolutely so this is if we're going to just go by the uh by my overhead here this is uh this is 72 we're merging into wn72 right here now it was the smallest of all the wns i would say along uh stutzpunkt vierville but it is probably the most famous one because it has the two giant casemates uh that it in quote that, that really you know incorporated it, and it's responsible for uh blocking the uh the road that leads inland to vierville sur mer um known as the dog one draw you know everyone knows that from saving private ryan despite the fact that the movie never even shows what the hell they're talking about but um <laughs> um anyway yeah so 72 let me open up my folder for 72 here <clears throat> And I'll, now, I'll I'll put a bit of video in just to just while we while you're getting stuff ready. So this is this some just my footage of there from a couple of years ago of, of what we're looking at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you can see the the, the big casemates that are still there, uh, the two, and we can get into details about them. But uh, those are the ones that people usually know about because they're still there. They've made them monuments now and such. So uh, it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, and people are asking about whether there's been a LIDAR scan of, of the beach. Well, there was the History Channel documentary that I worked on a little bit with Steve Zaloga, which was the 70th. Uh, a company in Ireland did a LIDAR scan from 73 all the way down to Les Moulin, and they had intended to do the entire beach. They did it over two days, but that LIDAR scan they did was only used for documentary and has never been made available beyond them, which I think was a bit of a pity because they spent all this time. They had the LIDAR team on the beach. They had a guy with a camera connected to it by Bluetooth who was going inside bunkers and taking pictures. Then they were mapping it all out. And they used some of that for the documentary. It's called uh, D-Day uh, 360, I think it was called. I've seen that, online. yeah. But there's a whole LIDAR scan they did that is held presumably somewhere. All the, all this is in somewhere with the company they engaged. But I don't know who that company was and where it is. But, yes, it has been done. I remember seeing that in that documentary. I was like, well, this is really cool. What Can I have access to this? And it was just like, oh, I guess not. I got to do my own research or something. Yeah. But the, so, um, I'll, put your, I'll put your images up. So we've got um, yeah 72 again now. So um, – and, and yeah, over to you to, to elaborate on what you found, what you've discovered. Right. Well, seventy-two is is 
the most fascinating to me because uh, out of all these WNs, I mean, everyone, like I say, talks about the Gambia house and stuff like that. 72, though, had tons of French houses in it, in that valley. What's called the Vierville draw, usually, is what people usually call it, or the Vierville, you know, valley or something like that. It's this this uh, road, the, the, the heart of it is this road that leads inland to the town of Vierville, which is obviously very important for the Americans because they wanted to get their tanks and armored vehicles and stuff like that off the beach. Um, and the Germans knew this, so they blocked the whole thing with this giant anti-tank wall right here. That's what the purple is. Um, and I can, of course, switch back and forth if you want to see the unmarked photo. But um, uh, so in terms of we can start with the fortifications, though. And uh, with WN-72, uh, the most prominent one is, of course, the R-677, uh, Regalbau 677. 677 refers to any of the Regal Bow constructions that contain 88 millimeter cannons. And in this case, a PAC-43 and uh, that, that uh, housed this. And there was another one on the complete opposite side of the beach at WN-61, it was, yes, um, that fired the other direction. So you have two 88s firing uh, at both points along the entire beach. And again, you know, as we were looking at all these fortifications, I mean, look at the, they're all, all the embrasures. That's the embrasure right there. For this one back here, the SK, that's the embrasure and that's the opposite embrasure. They all face sideways. They don't face the ocean. They all shoot sideways. And so they have a nice, nice, long enfilading view of fire, which, you know, you can hit the, the enemy on the side. And they don't have to worry about getting struck by, you know, uh, destroyers and such like that that are sitting out in the sea. You know, they they uh, what I, I call them, the wings usually on the uh, the coastal uh the coastal uh, bunkers. And here, let me just switch to a photo of one it's instead of just, you know, talking about this. Um, uno momento. Uh, let's just, let's go to the R677. Yeah. Yeah. So here we go. This is a post D Day photo. Um, now, all of these, you can see, again, this, the ocean is this way. They got, the, I call these wings. I don't know if there's an actual name for them, but coastal guns, uh, coastal fortifications, they always got these wings on them. And it is to protect and also hide camouflage in a certain way, um, the embrasure of the gun to protect it from naval fire. Because if this if this bunker right here was just facing the ocean, like if a destroyer was out in the ocean, this right here is just what they saw. Guess where they're shooting? <laughs> right in that giant opening. So that's another thing that I see like in movies and TV shows and stuff like that, or in video games. It's just like, wow, you know, that, uh, that bunker right there, that, uh, with that prominent embrasure facing the ocean, I guess what they're going to shoot into. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, they always have these wings right here that protect them. And, um, now what's cool though, about the, uh, about the R677, uh, at WN72 is that well, there's a there's a number of things that are really unique and interesting with it and yeah, the one is list yeah there's lots of them yeah right yeah th this one this this is a this is a really cool bunker um what you see right here is an anti-tank wall protruding from the side of the bunker now if we go back to the aerial photo right here i'm just going to switch to the unmarked version here is what we were just looking at now you can see that's the wall right there protruding and this is before it was destroyed the photo we were looking at was after it was destroyed but this is before it was destroyed and you can see it's staggered. There's a little, there's a little niche in there for uh, people to pass through by foot, but a vehicle cannot get through this. You know, here's it's, it's pretty thick and it goes all the way to the escarpment right here. It just plows right into the, the, the hill of WN 71. And again, yeah, it's to block tanks from coming through completely over here. Here's a tank trap. That's like a trench that probably has, you know, uh, steel beams inside it for if a tank fell in or something. There's the line of thick concertina wire right there. Um, but yeah, this is the R677 right here. That's the trench to go into the back right here. So let's switch back to the view of the bunker. Um, now, you know, on the surface, when you look at it post D-Day, it seems just pretty, you know, run of the mill German fortification with the exception of this anti-tank wall protruding from its side. But you can also see as you get closer and look at more details, there's all these bits of cobblestone and, uh, and things like that on the front of it. And it kind of looks like it's all been broken away. And that's because the R677 was actually built within a shell of what was a French hotel originally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's called the Eden, I believe. Um, and uh, that's what this is also over here. Now, 
I've seen lots of books talk about this. Uh, well, they kind of mention it offhand. They say that uh, now with the R677 at WN72, what was really interesting about it is that it had a fake porch that the Germans built attached to the side. Exactly. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Yeah. And they say it's made out of wood. And they say, you know, it's and it's like, no, actually, those are that's the that's the porch of the Eden Hotel before it was destroyed. Now, let's go on that note. Let's switch to some footage, some photos of the Eden Hotel. This is the Eden Hotel before, way before World War II. This is probably taken like in the 30s right here. Um, what we were just looking at, let me see here. This right here, see how there's cobblestone and everything? And then there's this cement piece right here. That is this right here. Yeah. So this right here is eventually where the future embouchure of the R677 ended up. Let's see, here's another view of it. This is looking on top of the hill. This is the this is the hotel. This is the reverse angle of it. Um, you can see it again right over here. It's a big building. You can tell. I mean, you can and you can see it. It, it has like three porches. You know, the the three terraces. Um, there it is again. Some more stuff. I have some. There's a really great photo I have of it. Here we go. You can really see that porch right there. And this is what eventually was integrated into the R677. People think, yeah, oh, the Germans built a fake porch. Like, no, it was already there. It was integrated into the building. That, 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 you're right. I was reading about that because I was doing my prep for this. The books say the porch was added to the bunker. No, no, no. Folks, this was at the, at the very early planning stages of 72. Someone came along and decided to build the bunker inside the hotel. That was, that was yes. the way around it decided, not the other way around. And, and they did their best, as you said there, to incorporate it into the structure for camouflage, just to, to, to hide it. Um, and, yeah, every time I read that fake porch bit, I go, no, it's, 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 it's an original porch that was already there in front of the bunker. And, yeah, yeah it's it, and it's again, it's one of those things like that is way more interesting, in my opinion, than the fact that they yeah, like th oh, yeah. they could they incorporated their fortification into an existing like building. Like, wow, there it is right there. You know, again, sometime probably in the 20s or 30s. Um, good view of the side right there. You know, here, here's a great view of the terrace. And you can actually see a lot of these support uh, columns and stuff like that. You can see them when you look at the uh, the R677 after D-Day. I mean, it's all shattered and shot to hell. But uh, you can still see parts of it when you look, you compare before and after photos. It's really interesting. And, um, you know, to go off what we're talking about here with the uh, uh, with that whole thing, there is a great photo um, taken in, I believe, 1943. I'm trying to pull it up right now. Um, yeah, here we go. Taken in 1943 that shows this exact area. And that right there is the Eden Hotel. And you can tell the entire two top layers have been completely flattened. They're in the process of constructing. Yeah, and it's gutted. You can see because the, the, the dark shadows is because internally they've obviously stripped it away. They've they've gone in there. It's like when you see a building being restored now where they want to keep the original facade, but inside they want to put modern stuff. So they, yes. they gut the inside, probably put RSJs in there, load bearing beams and stuff. And then once they've got it open with the space, then they make the bunker inside. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, Paul, that's really, I'm glad that you said that because I wanted to show another photo here. I mean, we're just going to speed through all these photos. Um, but uh, where is it? Where is it? I know it's right here. Um, and people are loving this, by the way. They're, they're, they're embracing the geekiness. So it's really <laughs> Gotta love the nerdism. Um, let's see here. Uh, I know I have it somewhere in here. Where is it? Um, 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 um. And it's oh, annoying. What while you're looking good. is that when they when they made the bunker into the National Guard monument, they put the triangular sloping defile wall on, which is how those bunkers normally looked. Right. They yeah. Create the look of the Omaha one. You think why why didn't they restore it to how it was, not make it look like a generic one? It's so annoying. They put the triangular wall in there. Yes, that's how most of them look. But the point <laughs> is that and I've always added the reason they went for the stepped look is to make it look more like a conventional civilian structure because triangle walls are specifically to do with bunkers. So if yes. 
but if they do the step thing, it could be it could be kind of a part of a rando. It could just be part of the design. So they they the Germans went to the trouble of making the triangular wall not triangular, so it would look like part of this original structure. So yeah, right, yeah. That's that's a no, that's that's really cool too. But what were you just saying about like you know they probably went in and put support beams in? This is a photo taken in September of forty four, and you can really see the terrace right here. We're just talking about. Look at this right here. You can see the steel girder that's, yeah, there that's we are. Yep. stabbing yeah. through the terrace, and it's going all. It's like it's embedded in the actual structure itself. So that's that's clearly they they clearly did that. What you were just saying, you know. Um, yeah. But this is right here. Like okay, compare compare like this right here. What we're looking at, this right here, that is that right there. And you can tell yeah. because the, 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 the lower part of it has those curved uh, columns right there, which are these right here. Yeah, so, yeah. And it's, and it's a bit, I know I will, you'll show your color image soon, but it's always difficult to interpret from the, from the black and white photos whether the Germans went to any kind of painting details with colors on the side of it. Because that's, that would be intriguing to know as to how much they kind of made it look, tried to make it like a villa. Because, you know, we know coastal resorts often use lots of nice colors to attract punters, you know, but holiday because there's a yellows and blues and, and we can't tell from black and white photos but whether they did anything like that it would be i mean i'd love to know uh yeah i would too well they did paint a lot of their fortifications you know they yeah. they, they would paint them with camouflage colors stuff. sometimes they would paint them to look like houses but uh um if you don't mind can i can i share my uh my artwork yeah please yeah please yeah. do so this is my this is my artistic interpretation i'm a i'm a uh, an illustrator and uh this right here is my reconstruction of the R677 before D-Day. And like I say, you can see the porch that's integrated into the whole thing. Um, I got some stuff that I, I'll always admit if I get something wrong in my in my artwork. But uh, uh, from a photo I saw after I, I did this, uh, here, one second, please. No worries. And 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 and, my, and if you're not following Michael on Facebook and, and and the groups he joins, you should be doing it, folks. Because honestly, he, the information is done. People are saying that how many hours must Michael have spent doing this? Well, the answer is lots and lots and lots. So um, yeah, no, just amazing stuff. And this graphic is something that has added so much of a. It's basically bringing together all this examination into a single image. Although, as you said, there you 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 will probably go on to amend it and keep upgrading it and making it yes. better. But yeah, it's it's putting together all the information. Right, because in a photo that I saw um, after I did this drawing that was taken from this almost this that perspective on the beach, uh, there were like boards and bricks and stuff that were in these uh, these. Uh, oops, that's another one in these. Um, these uh, openings right here. And in, in my drawing, I just depicted as though it was completely open. But uh, but like you were saying, in terms of where they painted it or not, I wasn't sure, obviously. So I just went by what the actual stone in the area would have looked like, which is that kind of, uh, you know, uh, light tan color. Um, and uh, I did, though, to have some artistic freedom with showing the inside of the shell of the Eden Hotel. And I, you can see I put some like remnants of carpet and stuff that were left behind after they ripped through it and everything. It's just stuff that I guessed, I guess what it would have been like on the inside. You can see like plaster and stuff like that um, lining it. This, uh, the remnants of this fence bit right here were uh, taken from, uh, for reference, were taken from, let me see, I have so many photos of this thing. Um, this photo right here. Um, this photo right here does a pretty good job showing the terrace, and you can see how that railing and stuff was. There were remnants of it that were still there. I, you know, I depicted all that as best I could along here. Um, but uh, but yeah, you can tell that the wall of the uh, Eden Hotel went in front of the um, R six R six seven seven to camouflage it. And even the anti-tank wall had bits of stone and things like that cobblestone that were in front of it to camouflage, to make it look like a house, you know, to make it look like what it originally was. Um, and you've put the MG34 on the barrel of a the gun there as well, haven't you? Yep, yep, I did. <laughs> and that, again, it's like, who knows if, the, obviously that wouldn't have been there during the battle, but like, it's a cool bit of trivia. So I wanted to include it in my drawing. Um, and uh, if we look at photos it taken inside of this place, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I don't know if I have any here. Let me see. Th these are all uh, modern photos inside it. Um, it's a model. It's some of the sides of it. So many things. Um, 
don't know if I have if that's a range uh, identicator. Yeah, that's, and they have that I I last saw them a few. They have faded so much. I went in there maybe ten years ago, and they were still vaguely visible. And the oh. last time inside, they they you just couldn't see them at all. So it, it, they they have now they again been lost to history. There was a team in there maybe five years ago who were looking into whether or not it could be preserved and whatever they can. They were British, in fact, but whatever happened, it never it never happened. So um. Yeah, yeah, that sucks. Um, but uh, okay, here we go. Yeah, here's a photo inside of uh, the R six seven seven. Yeah, you can see again they got those same brackets on there for an MG thirty four. Um, so just like what I was showing earlier. So yeah, I you know put it on there because it's got to be there if it was there. Um, now you can tell in the background right here, there's all these houses and such, and that's what I was going to get into next um, after covering the R six seven seven. Which, by the way. Um, on D-Day received a ton of fire. And that's why on all of the post-war photos of it, um, let me see here, uh, where did that go? Uh, yeah, I mean, we know it was hit by naval fire, tank fire, uh, you know, you, you know, anything the Americans had in that set of the beach ended up hitting it there. And, you know, we know that, that the anti-tank wall wasn't blown up till four to four or five in the afternoon. So there's right. a lot of firing in that area for, for you know, nine on 10 hours or something. So yeah. It right, got hit with other stuff. You can see, yeah, like I mean, it really got hit here. You can. What I love in this photo, you can see where a round chipped the steel beam right there. See that? Yeah, that's so cool. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, once this thing got hit by you know seventy-five millimeter tank fire, probably from the beach. I mean, it just the 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 the, the remnants of the Eden Hotel just fell off it, and yeah. uh, you know, just completely. This is a photo that was taken, you know, clearly well after D Day, after a lot of stuff had been cleared, and so was this one. But uh, in other photos that are, you know, closer to like this right here, I mean, it's just the, the bunker can withstand punishment like that. But like, a you know, a French house is just that, which is what it was. I mean, it just crumbled off of it. So unfortunately, today, there are no remnants of the Eden Hotel at all whatsoever around there. Yeah. yeah. Um, exit this. But the, anyway, so these houses right here in the background, yeah, that's another that's one thing that. Again, I find really interesting about uh, about W one seventy two is that uh, is that it had these houses in the background here, you know, in, in the back. And uh, the biggest one is this one right here, and it's called the Hotel Piprell. And uh, the Germans nicknamed it Old Theodore for some reason. I don't know why, um, but uh, that's what they called it. And uh, you know, it was a big house that was, uh, it was like a big manor house that was. I don't know, and it was a hotel that was constructed, I think, in like the 20s and 30s. And there were parts of it that had been in other areas in there that had been integrated into it. And uh, but it was a big house that the Germans, uh, the Germans around Beerville would use as like a retreat, you know, like a rest home or something like that. And um, let me see. I'll pull some stuff up with that. Um, here we go. Yeah, here, here's the pit row. Uh, and uh this is what it would look like, you know, during during and before yeah, before and during D-Day. And uh, here's a better photo of it. And, yeah, it's a big house that was sitting right in the middle of the uh, of the draw. Uh, and unfortunately, on D-Day, it was uh, destroyed by uh, American salvos, you know, from ships and stuff like that. I did, I'm not sure when exactly it was hit, but when you look at photos taken on uh, D-Day from USS Texas when it was during, you know, when it was shelling, it's clearly just demolished you know and i'm sure again like with you know french houses and stuff like that what i was saying how the, the the eden hotel just crumbled off i mean these houses didn't stand a chance against stuff like that you know they just would just blow into pieces and just crumble to the ground um but soon after world war ii a uh, a house that was very similar to it was rebuilt kind of in the same vicinity and it has been there ever since yeah so that's pretty cool and uh I was going to look at something else with this. Um, oh, yeah. So uh, let's see here. Here's a photo taken on D-Day of the shelling the Vierville draw right here, which I know you've seen. And uh, you can see some of a number of the houses that were, you know, that are in there. But you can tell where the the hotel Prip Rell is supposed to be, which is right here. I mean, it's completely gone. So I'm, I'm guessing these are ashes right here and, and smoke from the, the whole thing collapsing. Um, but you could really see it in, in all of, uh, you know, aerial photos and in, you know, uh, uh, things like that. Here it is in the in a photo taken in 
another recon photo taken in May of 1944. And there it is right there. And, you know, it's a big old house. And there's the, that's the R677 right there. And there's the Hotel Pipro. And also within the same area was the, I believe it's pronounced a Kusenberch. Um, and that is a house that uh, not a lot uh, is known about it, but it is another big house that's in the uh, valley right here. And that's it right there um, in my drawing. See, there's the, uh, the Hotel Pipro right here. In my drawing, it is this house right here. And again, it was another house that was destroyed on D-Day. Um, however, this section of it, this like garage right here, remained for a long time after D-Day. You can see it in post-D-Day photos, this garage right here. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's look at some stuff for, for that. Let me pull that up. Uh, villas. Um, let's see. Okay. Yeah, here, here's a good photo right here. We get a little bit of both the Hotel Piprell and the Kuzenbirch right in the background here. Um, you know, again, cobblestone, big house. But for some reason, not, not a lot is known about it. I haven't been able to find out if the Germans utilized it in any way um, or what. But yeah, it was. I, I've, I've seen a lot of people say that it was destroyed in 1943. But like we look at aerial photos and such. I mean, here's the photo taken on D-Day. It's right there. So like it was clearly yeah. there, you know, um, no, anyone who says that is wrong. So don't listen to that. But, uh, and then another house, the third house that was in the area was the Villa Mary. And that's this one right here. Now, from what I have read, this actually did have uh, a German Kriegsmarine uh, like unit attached to it at some point, like in 1943. Um, I don't think it, they were there by D-Day or anything like that, but there is some kind, there was some kind of connection that the Germans had with this. And they did allow the family, the Mary family, that was their name, was Mary. They did allow them to live there. And again, this is another house that on D-Day was just destroyed, you know, by uh, by naval gunfire and everything like that. And um, we can even, uh, again, in my, in my drawing, it's this one up here. I got color uh, uh, references just from studying uh, buildings in the area. So unfortunately, there's no color images exist of it. Colin is saying he he thinks the hotel served as a mess facility. That one, the, the hotel. Uh, which, oh. which do you mean, Colin? Do you mean the Pepro? Or what? he'll 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 add that in a minute. But um, yeah, but Colin, that's um. And also, folks, we should just quickly reference the fact that when they made Saving Private Ryan, not that we're doing a movie critique, they decided not to put any of the houses in anywhere in the background because nope. Dale Dye told me this. They didn't want to dilute. The fear effect they wanted to fear, fear effect they wanted to convey the viewer. They wanted you as a viewer when you saw that ramp go down to see a kind of craggy cliff top position with machine guns and barbed wire and bunkers, and not be distracted by oh look, there's hotels and houses. So that that fact they made that decision for the film has since that film came out, as so many people have turned up to Omaha Beach, and the, the opening question they say to a tour guide is oh I assume none of these houses were here in World War Two, and you go well. Sometimes they're rebuilt versions of them, but yes, a lot of these houses were and hotels were here in World War II. It's just the movie decide not to put them in. Right, of course, no, and uh, I uh, well, I got my own issues with uh, Dale Die, but um, that that's uh, that doesn't surprise me, you know. That, and I heard Spielberg say a lot of stuff like that, like, well, we did it because we had to convey this message and stuff like that. And I always say that if you're going to do a historical film, depict it as it actually was. And you, as a filmmaker, decide how to make that interesting for the viewer. You know, I think that's the ultimate. Don't change history. You know, show history for what it was. But you, as the storyteller, need to need to know how to depict it in a way that's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I so, think I agree. Yeah, right. Yeah, but uh, so now I don't think there are any shot. There are any shots of the Hotel Piperell ruins. But uh, here's is uh, here are the ruins of the Kusenberch um sometime after d-day and uh just you know pile of rubble um here are ruins of the ho of the the mary uh, house just just completely destroyed you know i mean these these houses didn't stand a chance um so what was i what else was i gonna do but uh but yeah again yeah it's something that people don't really think about the fact that oh of course there weren't houses there it's like yeah there were actually so again it's uh it's another interesting thing. Now, this house behind the Hotel Piprell, I've never been able to find a name for it. Um, but there are photos of it. There are a lots of photos of it that exist. You know, we can you can see it right there. Yep. You know, you can see it in all kinds of 
that's after the war. That's that's remnants of Villa Mary, and that's that garage for the Kusenberch. Um, sometime like probably 1946 or 45. Um, and that's the Villa Mary. There's the Kusenberch. This is probably like early 1900s. Uh, there's a nice shot of the Kusenberch. Yeah, you can tell these like these types of houses right here. These are what the Germans would have demolished when they yeah. uh, put in their fortifications and such. And it just uh, I'm reinforcing the idea, of course, folks, if you're not aware of this, is that this part of the coast was a resort town. That this the idea that 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 the Germans put stuff there and they were the first to build stuff. No, this had been a very popular tourist resort since basically trains enabled people to come to Paris to the coast for the weekend. You see the same thing up in the Sword Beach, Wistram, Luc Sommer, Leon Sommer, guest houses, uh, uh hotels, uh casinos. This was this was a busy, busy area. The Saint Laurent Sommer had a tram station. People would be go taken down to the beaches, the accommodation. There were beach huts and uh and almost donkey rides and, and ice creams. It was a conventional kind of Victorian, I would say, in Britain and onwards era seaside resorts. So um that that's that's what it was, and to some extent it's what it is today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um that's uh that's another real interesting thing that uh you know for Parisians and stuff like that, this was a nice getaway. And uh even by D like even by D Day, there were still like Parisians uh you know, visiting and stuff. Um yeah, parts of Deerville and everything. Um, you can kind of, I don't know, you can kind of see it here. When, this is going to become, uh, this is going to become important in a minute. But uh, the Kusenberch had a brick wall that surrounded its front yard, and it came all the way down to the beach right here and wrapped around. And uh, let me see if I can find a better photo of it. Um, I know I've seen more detailed. You can kind of see it right here. That's the Kusenberch right there. That's the brick wall that came down and went along the beach. Now that is really important right here. The fact this brick wall right here that went along the beach uh, parallel to it is really important because the next fortification that I want to talk about and this is, is a bit, this is this is like the I'm I'm now like watching my favorite band and waiting them to get to my favorite song. <laughs> this is this is the bit that when you broke this on on Facebook I was like oh wow so Folks, place yourself. This is really cool stuff coming up. Right, right. So the the other infamous structure in the area of W72 is the SK bunker. Now, SK stands for Zolder Construction or in German, Special Construction. And um, what's really interesting is that it is not a Regal Bau design at all. It is a special construction that was either probably, you know, uh, designed by someone someone probably from organization tote or something like that in the area who was constructing these because they are technically not a this this design is not a design that adheres to any like actual german bunker plans however you see this design all over the place in normandy especially along like grand camp uh near the via river and stuff like that you see like, like wn90 wn you know 82 and stuff like that you see this exact type of bunker now what's interesting about this bunker You'll see its embrasure right there, correct? Well, it actually has two of them. It is a double embrasure pillbox, and it houses a gun on a swivel. And I'll get into to detail about the gun in a minute. But yeah, that's a blueprint of it. This is the embrasure we were just looking at, and this is the other embrasure. This bunker had two embrasures, one that fired, one that faced west, and one that faced east. And inside the uh, inside the bunker was a fifty or a five centimeter. Uh, KWK 38. Uh, let me see if I have a good photo of uh, of that. Um, I can find a reference or something like that. But uh, here is a not so clear photo of the gun inside the SK itself. Now, again, hey, what we we're talking about those brackets? It's got them. <laughs> you know, it's for an MG 34. Um, but this is a gun that was on a swivel, and it could it could just you know. Traverse, you know, and in, in for both uh, uh, embrasures. Now, I kind of suspect that on D-Day, it probably fired uh, west and let the R677 fire east, perhaps. I don't have anything to back that up, but uh, that's just a a, uh, a guess. Um, if anyone has anything else to say about that, I would be willing so, to uh, hear I, I don't but, know that we have much about what it fired or, or if it fired or how much it fired, but it, it would make, well, I don't know, except there, there were no... What targets are there to the west, though? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I would right. think it would be going east uh, myself. 
Yeah, um, that's my, that's my guess because there wasn't a lot of you know firepower yeah. facing that direction anyway. But um, I'll just well, I'll just I'll just show my modern video. Then we'll come back to your thing. Just 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 to, just to give an idea of what it looks like today, because obviously the, the embrasure is kind of full up. But just just because uh, you know it's all been your stuff. I try to just use a little bit of mine, give it a bit of color as well. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, and you know the the wall that the bunker is still there but the structures around it have been incorporated because now you can actually move under that there's kind of a uh, coast guard position under the wall now that is is partly based on real stuff it's post-war additions as well but there's there's original stuff there to see and there's non-original as well if you're looking if you're standing there folks you'll realize yourself you'll kind of realize that there's boundaries between authenticity and 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 post-war improvements and developments but that's what it looks like today folks yeah yeah exactly and um yeah it's not very impressive looking today but yeah at the time like i said it had those wings that came off the embrasures that would protect it and i can get into more stuff what's really cool right there and that that footage you're showing you can see the remnants of the cobblestone wall that was incorporated into yeah, it exactly. it's still there like that's crazy but um and there's there's what it's field of fire would have been to, towards the east roughly that's me standing beside the bunker so Low, lower than the French 75 up in 73, but still the same the same view in terms of that of down the beach. That was just after sunrise that that morning. You can see there's the the the, um, the damage that was hit by tank fire, naval fire, and it's the block technique from the outside. So it's suggesting it's a 43 or or, or early 44. Then I'll put your that's my video. I'll put your go back to your footage again. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, very awesome. But. Uh... The, the funny thing is, is that these KWK-38 uh, swivel guns, um, they're everywhere, uh, like in Normandy and such. And uh, they're usually in a ring stand position, um, you know, concrete ring stand position. Here, I got a photo I can uh, I can share here that uh, shows that. Let's see. Not a very clear photo, but a photo nonetheless. Here we go. Um, now, this yeah. one... Uh, yeah. You see those ones at Pegasus Bridge, Corsell, Juno, Bernier, Samir, they're, they're all over the place. That's the standard. You know, but um, again, and it, we'd love to know, going back to the early part of the conference, who was the architect, designer, officer who's in charge of developing these bespoke positions for this part of Omaha Beach? Because it, it would be lovely to know. I don't expect we'll ever find out. But who was... At what level were these improvements, changes being made? Is is really an intriguing question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but uh, this right here is the the model that was inside the SK. Well, I just call it the SK bunker. Um, yeah. But there are two versions of two barrels, and one is the uh, the longer uh, L60 barrel, which has a muzzle break at the end of it, and the other is the shorter L42 barrel, which is what this is right here, and that's what. Uh, was inside the SK, which is right here. Um, now there are there are a number of them along Omaha Beach that had the uh, L60 barrel on them, but this one inside it had the uh, L42 barrel, which I can only imagine. Like if this thing is firing, that must just be pure hell for the crew inside there. I mean, it's not very it's not very long. It doesn't completely go outside of the embrasure. I mean, that that must really suck. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, but uh, and another thing too, uh, you can see it in this photo is that the embrasures of the SK have these bolts along the uh, the embrasure, um, and you can see them especially like in the, let's see like this photo right here. You can see these bolts along here, and I can only imagine that those are for some kind of steel grate that they would attach in case like the there was a storm or something and the tide yeah, came in. I was up on with my mate Stuart up uh, uh, the Leverie area, Gafosca Fontenay up kind of uh, on the on the on the, the estuary, and they have those same brackets there with like hinges to, to something to fold up or down. So yes, yeah, storm protection, wind protection, and whatever it be may have also possibly incorporated camouflage as well. But that is something you definitely see around Normandy. Right, right. Um, it's very very interesting. Now another thing too is that see this kind of. Uh cut inside the uh the concrete right here the opposite embrasure has one as well and i have also seen a uh an sk with the, the same type of model at i think wn90 and it has that same cut as well so it's like was that actually because i just thought that was battle damage when i first saw it so is that actually something done by the germans to have a better view of fire or something i don't know well, that now that's a question. If it's a, if it's the same on both sides, that's I, I've always looked at that and just assumed battle damage. But right, yeah, but 
yeah, because there's another one. Yeah, there's. Let me see if I can find the. You can kind of see it there, but I saw it in a. Uh, here, I have I have my book right here. Um, wow, that's yeah. that's another interesting question. Yeah. Um, would you excuse me for one moment? My phone's ringing. Yep, no worries. Um, so, folks, just while Michael's just taking a break there, just don't forget next week we have our. Uh, animals at war week so on monday we are starting off with a look um uh damien val is taking us through the work of the royal army veterinary corps we've got shows about uh uh, dogs being going off from the U.S. civilian to going to the military life, military life to be volunteer. We've got shows about transport, horse transport, Red Army, German Army. So lots of stuff coming up about animals and more shows coming up. So yeah, um, yeah. Thanks for thanks, thanks for that, Michael. So yeah, you got the have you got the bunker there. There's the photo. Yeah. So yeah, there's a photo in this book that shows because the opposite um, the opposite Ember shirt today has a shed over it. I know you know that. Um, yeah. So this is inside that shed right there. Let's try and focus on that. And you can see it has that same cut in the oh, aperture right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what wow. is going on? Now, that's really interesting now. Uh, and I wonder whether someone's saying is increased travel for mus muzzle depression. Is it, yeah, is it to get a lower angle on the beach? I don't know. But I would have think that bunker being low as it is, it wouldn't need to have a lower, I would have, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's, again, this yeah. this. This is stuff we don't know. We're still trying to figure things out, uh, you know, years and years later. <laughs> is it, Leslie is saying, is it for drainage? But, um, you, you mm. it's, yeah, we'll, we'll find out. Um, well, we won't find out. We'll try and find out. But <laughs> let's continue to the wall because that's where it's going to get really the, the cool bit is coming up soon, I hope. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, if we go back to our overhead here, um, this is the, the SK is the most kind of obscure one that in terms of this, uh, this whole thing. And uh, you can see, though, as the this is the ember, this is where the ember is right here. There's one of the wings and you can see this wall right here that goes along the, uh, the, the that goes along parallel to the beach that protrudes off of the SK. Kind of like what the anti-tank wall does over with the R677, except this is that surrounding wall from the Kusenbirch's front lawn. That the Germans are now using to basically hide at the trench that's where they have access to the SK. And now, also, if you look at the trench here, that's what this dark mark is right here. And you can even see like a plank that's been set over it so someone can cross. Um, you can see these two veins that break off here. And I have the theory that this is an, some kind of observation post that uh they would have before the battle and once like if, if anyone was approaching or something they would seal it up because obviously you're not going to have your head right here when there's a cannon going off right here um there's second vein right here uh i can pull up a photo in a minute that shows some of the stuff that i'm that i'm talking about um i believe this actually is where there was a possible either observation post or a machine gun position um let me just go to the photo right right now because I just want to talk about it. Um, this photo right here is the best photo of this wall that we're talking about. And it's remnants right here that you can see coming off of the SK. This is the SK right here. And you can see it has a lot of cobblestone covering it. It doesn't look like how it does in um, this photo right here. This is what people usually think of when they think of these bunkers. Like, no, this whole thing would have been buried. This all was done by the Americans right here. They cleared all this crap out so they could make way for their vehicles and such. Um, but actually, before that, it was very well hidden. There's all this cobblestone piled up around it. Um, it had, you know, dirt on top of it and the wall that protruded off it. Now, I am assuming this right in here is where that OP is I'm talking about. And this is a possibility of an embrasure for a uh, possible maybe observation post or machine gun position of uh, this trench right here because it's an L shape. The, uh, it, the the wall comes and it, it stops right in here. It's an L shape. And the reason why I say it's a possible machine gun nest is because in um, Vince Milano's book, Normandy Front, he interviewed a uh, German machine gunner who claimed to be at Omaha Beach. His name was Carl Wegner. And Carl Wegner is someone who I have been skeptical about for a long time. I mean, I'm Me too. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, I, I see that name get thrown around. So I've, I've rarely ever found resources to it, but I found where it stemmed from. 
and it was from this book Normandy Front yeah. by Vince Milano. So I just friended Vince Milano on Facebook and I started talking to him. I said, okay, tell me what the resources are for Carl Wagner because and, and all that stuff. And because that's where it stems from. And he told me that he interviewed him sometime in the 1980s and he was very reluctant to talk about his his uh stuff. He was from the uh uh the 916th, which did actually come to Veerville the day before um uh what's it called? D-Day, sorry. Um <laughs> and uh he said that, uh, and I said, okay, so tell, because he says in the book that he was firing from a position down, like that described this sort of thing, close to the beach, right down there amongst all this stuff. Um, so I said, is this right here? Is I showed him this image. Is that where Carl Wegner said he was? And he said, I showed Carl Wegner a map of the area. He pointed vaguely in the direction where this is right here. Mm. So I said, okay. And I said, do you have anything else about Carl Wegner? He's like, no, the last time I talked to him was in the 1980s. I mean, he's probably dead now. So um, again, I am not completely sold on Carl Wegner, but at least he did provide me with something that was, you know, ha had some kind of validity to it. So that's yeah. why I say this is a possible machine gun position because it's at an L shape. And if we go back to that photo, um, where is it? I just had it. Um, yeah, if we go back to this photo, we see that this this if this is an embouchure right here, we see that it is faced because that's where the corner is right there. We see that it is facing away from this right here. So if anyone was going to have an embouchure um, in a position like this next to a bunker, it would be facing this direction with the gun facing his machine gun probably facing this direction again, firing along the beach rather than out uh, out uh, to sea. You know, typical German yeah. fashion. And if he was in this area right here with this wall, that would probably be enough to protect him from the blast of the cannon right here. Just just my thoughts. I mean, you could disagree. Yeah, I mean, we also know that there was the Operation Aquatint uh, disastrous raid that happened in September 42 on Omaha Beach. So maybe mm -hmm. in addition to thinking about having defenses for a full scale invasion, so the 75, the 50, what have you, maybe they're thinking also about some lesser defenses for if and if and when some kind of commando mission comes in where you don't necessarily want to use the 50, but you right. want to. And, so, and, and Squeak, Secret Squirrel is saying that it's possibly uh, observation posts before they withdrew back the casement. So that, that's a possibility. And by yeah. the way, we seem to have an answer about the, the, the U-shaped bit in the bunkers. And, and Jersey War Tours is saying, we see this on bunkers on Jersey for the storm shutters to fit. So you lower the barrel of a gun so the storm shutters can fit in. And that two or three people said that. So it seems we have, have at least got a working theory. So thank you very much for that. So that's that makes sense. That so that cut that cut is not battle damage then? No. That's, that The consensus is that is in bunkers in Jersey to lower the... If you, if you can show the picture of the, the bunker, the gun... With how far does the gun barrel uh, come out from the, the bunker? Would that we can maybe kind of put it to? Uh, a it's it's hard it to say because out. it's hard to say because the, the the I don't have any clear images of like the gun itself, um, you know, uh, being being very visible. Like, let me see here. Uh, so the one from the side, the one where you had it, where you could see the, the MG thirty four bracket. Okay, yeah. Let me go back to that. It does. It does protrude beyond the, the outer wall of concrete. No, That's yeah. the cut right there. So that could be lowered to then fit. The, that makes sense. No, I'm <laughs> liking that. Until someone proves, I, I will have that as a working theory. Until someone proves it wrong. Um, I love well, that. That's because yeah, I, I had seen because I was talking because you know I, I mentioned I have seen this type of this type of casemate, this SK in other parts in Jersey, in Grand Camp, especially around the like the Via River. So and that's where I saw that same exact. You cut, and I'm like, what the hell's going on here? So, holy crap, dude. And Fergus John is saying the cutout is for barrel change. The barrel had to be depressed to five degrees in order to extract. So it could have been for that as well, or in or uh, so yeah, that's another 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 theory to add to the um to add to the mix there. Whew, well, we've okay. got lots of ideas coming in. This is really good. Um <laughs> now, um, one great thing about uh uh, about the SK that people thought, but okay, so that's that's pretty much my thing. And I like what you said about like the commando stuff and everything like that, Paul. Um, that's did a great did you incorporate that opening into one of your illustrations? Did, didn't you? I did. Um, uh, not this, not the second one, but I did for the um, for the uh, what you might call it uh, for the first one, the observation post. So here we go. This is my artistic interpretation of the SK uh, before D Day, and as again, you can as you see in this photo right here, the one I just had pulled up. 
again, you know, crap, um, bushes, concertina wire all along the base of this right here. It wouldn't have been just completely, you know, cleared and flat like how, uh, how that uh, photo showed it after D-Day. But um, so as you can see, here's the wall protruding right here. And there's the bit that's kind of pressed up against next to the embrasure that you can see that's still there today that we saw, you know, in Paul's footage. Um, and this right here is my interpretation of what would be that possible observation post. Now I put some, I put some guys in here. I got, they got the rabbit ears. They got a field phone. Um, that's kind of, you know, my own interpretation of what that would have looked like. Um, but, uh, this right here, th this interpretation of the OP comes from, uh, the, um, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, here we go. Um, these, uh, these, uh, recon photos right here. So here we go. This is the next one in the bunch. So yeah, if we look at the, here's the SK right here, we can see it. There's the SK. That's the very, you know, uh, uh, angled embrasure right there, but that's it right there. And there's the wall. And what do we see right here? There's some kind of interruption in here. You know, it looks like where that trench, where we see that trench vein breaks off and goes to the wall. That's where it, it would be right there. So what is that? It's probably something that the Germans in my, this is my own theory. They broke that wall down and then added their own OP into it. And that's why in my drawing, um, it's, it's very makeshift. You know, you got your, you can see how the wall is built right here, but then when you get to this, it's all like, you know, crude and everything. And that makes sense. It's very plausible. People at Trent Telenko just said how he is appreciating the fact that me and you are talking, but we're also getting all this feedback and con con criticism and constructive additions from the, uh, from the, from the, the wonderful people watching It's So it's so cool. So we're, we're obviously going to overrun tonight, folks, but it doesn't matter. We'll just keep on going unless, unless Michael has to go somewhere, but, um, anything more to say about 72? Yeah. Um, well, absolutely. The, well, just, just real quick, this whole, like, uh, you know, rock pile right here on the skirt of, uh, of the SK, I got that, um, from, not from this photo right here, we can kind of see some of it there, but, uh, from this photo right here, now you can see where this thing was shot by 75 millimeter guns. You can see right there. Again, you can see where the round clipped that beam right there, that girder. Um, but you can see down here where rounds hit the ground and, shot things all over the place but you can see that there was like a rock pile that was there before it got hit so that's where that uh that's where that interpretation of it came from and as you can see inside there i got the mg34 mounted on the barrel because why not it's cool why not? Um, <laughs> uh, all right cool so i'm ready to move on to um the just this i think we should just talk about it real quick because it is something that you and i have have talked about, and that would be the uh, double embrasure pillbox of WN-72. Um, now, a lot of people know about the double embrasure pillbox of WN-71, but not a lot of people know about the one of WN-72, and that is because it is virtually buried today. But um, if we go back to the aerial right here, it is where this trench comes up. This is the, that's, that's the Kusenberts right there. That's the Villa Mary. This pathway turns into a trench, you can see all the dirt that lines lines it with they dug it up. And that's what this is right in here. That's what the double embrasure pillbox is right in here. Now, this right here, I I originally assumed because it's kind of a dog leg shape, I assumed that this was where the double embrasure pillbox was. And I wrongly depicted it in my uh in my drawing right here. Um, when I first did this, you can see I have it cut to the right of the trench as you get up here, uh, but yeah. In reality, going from from uh, from maps and stuff like that, it was actually on the left. It was actually on this side of it. If you were going up, is on the left side. Um, so this right here, I assume this is probably some observation post or whatever over here. Wow. Um, maybe, yeah. maybe an incomplete trench. Who knows? Um, but again, this is one that I've I've inquired a lot of people about, and it's unfortunate that it's it's basically gone like it's buried it's uh it's it's so overgrown this is what it looks like right here um this is taken a couple of years ago uh and uh it's cool though because these types of pillboxes that that kind of dog leg shape double embrasure pillbox i don't remember seeing them anywhere else like in normandy except for the uh le moulin uh, uh draw yeah there. there's two there um, yeah, there's that seven uh sixty 68 the one yeah there's, there's a couple over there that show it again 
this is the interesting thing about Omaha is there are these non-standard but but seemingly quite sensible and well thought out new types of bunkers. So, you know, again, folks, we, we talk about Omaha Beach so often, of course, from the the uh, the uh, the the Allied attack and the experience of the 29th and the first and the Rangers there. But in, in terms of the German defenses, there are some really interesting questions to ask and and um and solutions the Germans found to that. So that's that's the side. Any more theories about that? Well, oh, yeah, we know we know what it was supposed to do. We assume it was just almost a smaller version of the one at, at, at 71. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, also, we're pretty sure these housed French uh, uh, rebel machine guns, right? Not uh, yeah. MG42s. Um, and uh, oh, that that's another thing to go back to the, the SK, uh, if, if, if I may real quick, because there's yep. a lot to cover. Um, but uh, let's see, can I jump onto the blueprint of it? Let's see. Uh, one thing about the SK bunker at WN72 uh, that people like to point out a lot is that uh, it had a tow brook for a tank turret, for a, a French uh, Renault tank turret to be mounted. And uh, that's what, if we go back to the blueprint, that's what this is over here. However, there is no proof that there was a tank turret ever installed um i did there all the photos taken in the area at the time don't show it um there's no evidence there there were tank turret uh mounts what they call uh panzerstellung uh there were panzerstellungs along omaha but there was not one on the sk from what i have been able to research um let's see here yeah if we like if we look at photos any photos taken during the day or, or you know taken after or even like you know around that time um Here's a photo right here. See, that's the SK right down there. We see the hole for the tank turret, but it's not there. I mean, and it doesn't make sense that the Americans would remove it. I mean, why would they remove that one but not remove the other right. ones that you see it, photographs it, it of? Makes sense it was never fitted. If it was if it was damaged, it would you'd see it there damaged. And there are photos of damaged ones at other positions. So yeah, waiting for it to come. It it arrived, it didn't fit, they hadn't got it, it was under repair, whatever reason it wasn't there on D-Day. Right. And I also um, I read uh, in this book that I have right here, um, uh, Atlantic Wall, Omaha Beach, which you can only get in France. Um, I read that uh, it um, it was a, probably a, a tank turret for, or it was a turret for a rebel machine gun and not not a gun, not like a cannon or anything like that. Um, but uh, yeah, so this one right here. Yeah, that's that's the last fortification of WN72 is this pillbox. And unfortunately, and I've, I've asked I asked Paul and I asked uh other people, hey, can you go up there and see if you can get footage of it? And they're like, it's nearly impossible to get to. Well, we're going to try and go in the winter when hopefully we can get there. Now I know it is there, and that's what I admitted. I didn't know it was there. What we can do now, folks, is take you across to the one, the other side of the draw, and show you what the one at 71 was like as we move into phase into 71. Yes. So this is my footage, folks, uh, of going in the one. And, and me and Colin always snigger about this one because there's this dirty mattress inside. So we kind of refer to it as like a, a hobo um, kind of... Um, room with a view kind of thing but well i'll put up my video and then we'll we'll talk about 71 so this is this is the other you've all seen this for as you drive down the d1 draw the amount of tour buses to stop and they see it there but the question is can you get inside it well yes you can get inside it you just have to go up on the hill and crawl inside it's not it, it, you're not trespassing there are bunkers on omaha that, that you have to go into private property but this one is is okay to get into. So you'll see it there, folks, from the outside, and I'll take the camera goes inside it in a minute. So this is a, a bigger version of the one we just showed the photos of there, and another photo of it from the... Uh, and it's it's one of those ones I expect over the next few years we may end up losing it because yeah. it, it, it is subsiding away underneath it now. This is inside it. So so explain what would have been inside this one. You, well, you said yourself there, but uh, tell us again. Well, yeah, I... Um, you know, it, the... Um... The embrasures around there, they would have had uh, like a steel, I forgot what the actual um, uh, name is for it, but it's like a steel door that opens and closes. It has a mount for a machine gun on it. And again, French rebel machine gun is pretty much what we we assume was in these. Uh, not a German gun, but you know, like a, the French rebel for the type of mount that that was. And you can see kind of remnants of it right there. It was most likely uh, for that type of machine gun. Um, and... Uh, very small, you know, not a lot of uh, not a lot of room in there just for mostly like maybe three or four people. You know, it's a uh, it's not a gigantic gun deck or something like that. And as you can see the indentation there for where the steel plate used to be. Yeah. And 
looking out there. Now that one would have probably been made to cover guys cut like if it probably if, if someone was coming down from Vierville, like if the Americans went into Vierville and then they were coming back down to either clear the wall or something like that. This is probably meant for that. It's probably not going to attack guys coming off the beach. I, you can't even see the beach from the embershers. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's most likely to guard like guys coming down from Vierville to attack uh, the rear position. Um, pretty cool there. And, uh, you know, during uh, dur today, it's like, like you say, Paul, it, it looks like it's about to fall right off the cliff. Um, back then, though, there was uh, when it was made, it was there was a huge um, uh, like incline below it uh, that was eventually completely scooped up scooped away by the americans to make room for stuff you know it was a quarry but um and when i can show i have some photos that show some stuff about that but yeah it, it, it uh on d-day it would not have been just protruding out of the side of the cliff like that um so yeah here we go we're back on the map here um that is what we were just looking at right there that's that double embersher machine gun position right there and that's the one at whoops sorry whoops um, that's it right there, like we said, and then that's the one at WN72. So you got these cross firing right here. And again, if you look at the angle where these guns are positioned, this one's firing this direction, this one's firing this direction, probably going to catch anyone coming this way. Whereas this one is facing more towards the, the, uh, the anti-tank wall. Um, now let me go into my photos and see, um, And, and, and I always assumed, until you proved me wrong, that they were opposite each other, and they're not exactly opposite each other. They're roughly, well, I mean, it's not even the same distance away from the road. So I, I right. was looking directly across, assuming it was doing exactly the same thing. And the other question is, of course, were these already built at the very planning stages of these Vetus Fontes, or were they some later addition in that kind of early 44 shit the invasion's coming we better upgrade these i'd love to know at what point they 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 get incorporated into it because again all we have is kind of mostly the kind of the the, the leading up to d-day aerial photos so i'd love to know at what point they're in they were planned yeah i'd love to know too um i don't know i'm guessing just just guessing here that they were there from an early part because they are poured concrete they're yeah, not uh... i think they're earlier rather than later I yeah. think, it, and and the, the Stutz punkt was was allocated such quite early, wasn't it? It wasn't like it, that 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 it got that um, um, designation. I think in in forty three. So I assume at that point, and it may have all been as a re result of Operation Aquatint, of course. That and if you don't know what we're talking about, we've done a show on. I'll look back on the on the previous shows, folks. So Operation Aquatint was a British commando small scale raiding force action on september the 42 that was about intelligence gathering but it landed in omaha what became later on omaha beach in uh, it wasn't supposed to be there we think they were supposed to come ashore and sent on a green day pet and it mm -hmm. came ashore then was shot up by the germans and that mm -hmm. might have been the instigator for the improving of the defenses on omaha beach because there had been this what the germans would perceive as a commando raid so yeah we'll see i don't know it's um a it's lot, definitely... lot of things to think about it's definitely possible. Um, this one right here shows after after D Day, the Americans really clearing up this quarry right here, and you can see there's these rock crushers and stuff that they're uh, they're really you know doing a number on, which has been that way ever since. But before that, like on D Day, this all would have been a slope right here, and um, there, right there, right there, that's the uh, the pillbox of WN mm -hmm. seventy one, and that's uh, you can see where the ground comes right up to that embrasure. It's not sitting at the edge of a cliff. It's, yeah, uh, you know, yeah. it's, so that's how it originally was. And it looks like there are remnants of a net draped over it. Again, these things would have been camouflaged. Everything would have been. Um, so and, and the amount of times and I've said it, I said it myself, mm -hmm. in the end days, how that bunker was built into the cliff face. And the fact that you've proven it was never into a cliff face, it beca only became a cliff face after it was built into a much more of a, of a sloping hill. So there's, if tour guides are watching this, they'll have to kind of change a bit of their patter, I think, because uh, th th they are still guilty of saying that. And I was in the past myself. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, I've, I've said things that turned out to be wrong as well and stuff. And, and but uh, uh, Paul, can you go back to that, your footage of that bunker for a second? Yeah. I want well, to. Uh, um, yeah. Bear with me. Um, where's it gone? So you went from the okay. inside, okay. yeah. Yeah, now see, yeah. If, 
if uh, if you go to the outside of it, you know, let's let's look at it from the outside, um, looking up at the cliff. You can see right along the bottom part of that embrasure. I mean, you can see where all that concrete is rough. You know, yeah, you can see yeah. that that line is where the ground would have been originally. Yeah, so. no, that was that, that's exactly what it was. So yeah, no, that's that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, if you go back to again photos of while the Americans were clearing out that area, yeah, you can see that ground comes right up to that to that embrasure. And here's a here's a great Kodachrome photo that you rarely ever see stuff like this uh, around the area. But yeah, again, you can see it up there. You know, <coughs> I've never seen that photo. That that you, you're wow. This is um. You never seen that one? No, I haven't. <laughs> or if I have, I hadn't really, I hadn't identified what I was looking at. The thing is, what you've done, Michael, people identify, is you've spent hours poring over it. I've sometimes looked at these things, and yep, that's it. I can see that, and I'm not, and I've not, I've not done the, I've not done the geeky work. Um, but no, <laughs> stuff. Well, I'm glad to do it for you. If you ever need, uh, if you ever need uh, me to send you more photos, well, I mean, you've shared me, you shared photos with me that I never had, so I'll send you this one too. Um, yeah. I think I might have seen it. Well, no, maybe I, I don't know. Either way, I didn't know it had that bunker in it. That's the that's the revelation. And I and I must admit, I always thought that a lot of the the, the stonework they put or pulled away, they pulled away from the from the western side of the draw. But it looks like the majority they're taken away from the eastern side. So that's they are, yeah. All the time. Here's the here's the D one draw again. Um, you know, engineers. Uh, you can tell because they have the crest on their helmets uh, with mine detectors and such. Uh, and then you can oops, as uh, that half that tends to happen. Um, if you look at the very edge, yeah, you can see again, there it is. There's that, that pillbox up there. Um, yeah. and you can see remnants of the concertina wire and stuff like that. But, uh, what I find to be more interesting, I mean, that, that one is pretty popular, you know, that pillbox and it is cool. But, um, what I find more interesting about WN71 is the Feldmasig that, uh, has that, that is right at the edge of, uh, of the escarpment of WN71. And that's what this is right here. Now, pretty much completely buried um, with the exception of the embrasures. But uh, this is one that I always see when I see uh, interpretations of Omaha Beach, even when they try to do accurate ones that show the D1 draw and everything, this is always replaced by the Schnabel stand Saving Private Ryan bunker, you know, um, yeah. that big thing. Although, again, traditional German fashion. This was a tiny, tiny thing that had two embrasures that fired east or fired west and east. It did not fire directly out to sea. So the, this right here, that little block, that is a that is the, the, the lowest point of the um, structure. And that is a basically a place where they would fire two machine guns out this embrasure and out this one right here. Now let's go to photos of that. And Paul has some great video of it. Unfortunately, we can't look at it. Yeah, it's just it, uh, the problem is, folks. It's just it's, pri it's private property, so I don't really want to advertise the fact that I've been in there. But um, you know, I have been in there. But um, you know, um, but it, it's it is private property, so um, yeah, don't try and do it. But you can see it from the outside. It's in that. It's in the photo from the front of the of the seventy two eighty eight case, mate. You can see it up on the hill behind you, can't you? But yeah, and and we you know we we refer to it as being for machine guns, but. Sometimes it gets identified as observation. There we are, as observation, yeah. uh, different things there. But there are these recesses behind the wall for boxes, which I've always assumed were for, for ammunition. So I, I assume it's for machine gun. Again, not on a mount, just 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 kind of sitting there, either a thirty-four or something. Um, exactly. Yeah. And if, and uh, Paul, the photo you were talking about, like this is a clear one of it right here. But like this is the photo right here. Like that's the muzzle break yeah. for the Pack forty-three at the R six seven seven of WN seventy-two. You can see parts of the anti-tank wall right there. Zoom in. There it is right there. There is the Western embrasure that we were just looking at. So, yeah, you can see it. it it's very well camouflaged. You know, it, I mean, it's got stuff, just dirt yeah. all over it and everything. So it's it'd be hard to spot. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, that is a clear image of it. Now, I do have photos. Ooh, that's kind of a nasty photo. I do have photos inside it. Um, and uh, what's kind of cool is that you can see this like, there is a lot of poured concrete, but then there's a lot of like red brick. That's Again, it's a, a it's, it's a mix. It's a, it's hub, cobbled together, isn't it? There's bits of brick, there's bits of tile and stuff there. Again, it, it seems to have been. It, it's not a one era construction. It was probably built and then added to, or they tried to do something to it. It's it's interesting. I, I, just to add something, Gary is mentioning that the fact talking about why 
they could have in, in, increased the size of the viable defences. The German records show that in 1942, a false report of a planned Allied landing near Bayer got wind of it. The Germans got wind of that. So it was cover for torch, possibly. So that bit might have been why, with the fear of something happening in a Bayer, Bayer area, they increased the defence to Omar. But it's, a, it's another working theory. We've had so many... We've, we've maybe answered a few questions. We've also asked a whole lot more. So it's fantastic. It's 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 live detective work, folks, is what we're doing. <laughs> Abso Absolutely. Um, but uh, see, there's a blueprint of the Feldmassig. This right here yeah. is the it, you, really it's like it's an it's a storage that they just they thought, well, maybe let, let's add a machine gun position to it because this would be a good place for one. You know, it's it's not a, it's 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 not a, any kind of regal bow design or anything like that. It's very impromptu and everything like that it, yeah it's not uh it, it doesn't follow any kind of standard bunker design and, and yet the, the the evidence or, or or suggestion that it was a machine guns there is but when you read the accounts of some of the a 116th and b 116th people how baumgarten there's the, the captain taylor fellas those kind of people there and the diaries alex kershaw there does seem to be machine gun fire coming from that area, from the way they describe it. It was it was coming from above and to the left as they faced the beach there. So it makes it. I mean, obviously that could have just simply been a German on the top of the cliffs moving about with a with a with a machine gun he's carrying. But it doesn't prove definitively that there were machine guns in there. But that is the suggestion: is that is that it, it, there were machine guns there. And if you know the view from there, I'll just I'll just well, I'll just show a bit of a footage. Of, of roughly what the view to the beach would be like for that from that area it's not exactly inside the bunker but that's sort of the bay that's above the house that sits there yeah so if you imagine the machine guns being to the front of that you know they would have had a pretty devastating view down on the front of Venus on the 72 across in front of 73 and then the the, the eastern one could face right up towards Venus on the 70 and, and Les Moulins so yeah that that is a high but there, there's kind of that I'm standing there to the right of the of the of the embrasure a little bit higher, but that gives you an idea, folks, of what the field of fire would be like. Um, so yeah, it, it it makes sense to have machine guns there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and and you know, you go in the whole thing about how the Germans, you know, they would they would position their positions to fire, you know, along the beaches rather than directly out. You know, I, I when I read accounts and stuff like that of guys, you know, saying, oh, they they, they would have landed in front of WN seventy two or WN seventy three, and then. And you think about how they're getting shot at. It's like they're probably receiving fire from, you know, like WN70 or, you know, WN71. Like they're not receiving fire directly from the nest that they're going to. They're yeah, getting exactly. fire from sides. Yeah. Um, which is really interesting. And the, and the brickwork, you know, people are talking about it could have been something for, for the addition of, you know, something simple like just cooking areas or, or ventilation or something like that or seating areas. I mean, it, we don't know what the adapt adaptations were done in the theater by the troops who were there to improve their, there's a, there's some kind of dropping hatch where you could either throw things in or throw things out round about there as well, or ventilation. I mean, it's, again, it's one of these bunkers that it's described in the books, but often not fully, not that because, right. you know, it's in private property and, and so on and so forth. So it, yeah, it, it is a fascinating one and it proves that we are still, and people are kind of laughing and also admiring the fact, my honesty, the fact I don't know anything about Omar Beach. Anyone who ever claims as a tour guide, they know everything about Normandy is a liar. We are learning every single day. Me and Colin say every day, every day is a school day. And the thing is, as a tour guide or a historian, they, you, you, as long as you know the information you need to know to convey your, at the times you de need it. And the most I ever spend is a day on Omaha Beach. And I have enough stuff about all the Vida Stones desks to talk for two or three hours at each one. So the level of detail we're going to today, we've been on this two hours now about three Vida Stones desks. It's proof of the fact there's you know, there, there's a lot of stuff to still be discussed. There is a lot of stuff. Um, now, this is inside the, the that uh, yeah. that deck where you would have those machines. That's the Western Embrasure right there. And then uh, that's, again, the Western Embrasure. Now, I'm going to say, Paul, that I think there were gunners in here because if you get to the let's see, does, does it stop right there? As you get to the eastern embrasure, um, you see this, and I'll show you. Yeah, as you get to the eastern embrasure, you see this, and look, that's clear. Yes, some are definitely firing into it. That's for certain. Right. Yeah. That's clear yeah. battle damage, and you can see just based on the shape of this. I mean, you can see the trajectory of where that round came directly from the beach down, you know, and like at an angle. 
and you, know, you can see the identification card there too for the area, which is really cool. Again, you see those in all these fortifications. But I mean, it is possible that someone spotted it and said, hey, there's a position up there, take it out for good measure. But it's also possible that someone was firing a machine gun here, silenced that damn thing, you know, and they they sent a yeah, round, which is fired back at the tracer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, direct um, hit. Yeah. It, it could it could easily be one of the the, the surviving well most of the DDs of the 74th 74th Urban time were on the beach there and if you look there that as you say there a Sherman firing a 75 from somewhere long dog green dog white that is the right again don't be fooled by the earth in front of it folks it's been bits of earth have collapsed in front of it vegetation's grown it had the black and white photo of the of the western embrasure shows that it had been really clear to have this this open view and so yeah, no great. Well, stuff. a number a number of Shermans landed on Dog White Sector, which is the sector yeah. right next to it, and a number of uh, yeah from the seven hundred and forty uh, third, I believe, um, if I'm getting that number right. Um, and um, so I mean that is coming directly from the direction of where uh, of where Dog White Sector was. So and those tanks when they moved out the beach, they moved towards the draw, and that's where the t the dozers came in and they took care of the anti tank wall. So. It is definitely possible that those tanks coming off Dog White fired this round that that knocked this out right here. I mean, and if someone was standing right here, she, I mean, that dead instantly. I mean, that would yeah. have just been terrible. Um, now, and I think I even have some more photos of the. So there's the there it is again. That's the battle damage. Those are those recesses that you were talking about for ammo, uh, right there. Um, that's the stairway that goes down into it. Um, there's some more of that battle damage. I mean, just like perfect. You can you can just you can see where it hit. I mean, it's it's perfect. Um, and there it is on the outside. Now, I this is another illustration that I did. Now, this one I'm not too fond of because I got a number of things wrong in it uh, in the background, but I, I'll show it anyway. Uh, and this is the the Feldmusig. This is my interpretation of that Eastern Embrasure where that gunner would have been. Now, that gun, his machine gun, if the, he the gunner was like this in that, that, uh, Feldmusig, he, the barrel would probably be like just at the edge of the, uh, the embrasure here. He probably wouldn't have it completely sticking out like this. I wanted, uh, I, I, uh, at the time I wanted to see more of the gun and stuff like that, but you never know, you know, it's, it's just an assumption. And, um, where that tank round hit would have been like right here next to his head. So if this yeah. actually, this is an, this is a representation of an actual guy who was there, then that is, a uh, that is my interpretation of it. But in terms and, and of it, you know, you, what, you, what you do convey is the fact it's not a very big area. It's it's a it's a crap like like the twin embrasure on the draw. It's it's not very much space inside this. This is this is it's built for for, for practicality, not for comfort. Um, so if right. that shell came in there and you're standing anywhere inside that bunker, you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna be caught in the effects of it. So yeah, absolutely. Um, and and um, I, I depicted an MG34 because when you look, I looked at a. Uh, a inventory once i forgot who i got it from of the uh the 726th in Vierville, and they only had mg 34s they didn't have any any 42s listed they had mg 34s listed so that's why i depicted this here and uh and yeah so i, I got some things wrong with wn 72 back here that i'm not proud of so uh that's why I, I don't really talk about it for that one but uh that was one of my my first ones that i did i really wanted to depict this feldmasig and uh i um I might do another drawing of it with the Western Embrasher for, you know, next time or something like that. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, you know, when it comes to WN-71, though, I don't know a whole lot about, uh, I mean, I, I've decoded things, you know, based on the overheads and such like that. But I know there were some shelters up here and some trenches, but there wasn't a whole lot up on WN-71. No, it, it seems to be, um, I mean, there's a couple of mortar positions and there's the sort of underground shelf that you can call in now. And, and most of that stuff, folks, if you go up the path from the top of the D1 the D drawer, you can walk around most of 71 uh, and, and look at it, you know, without trespassing anywhere. But it's it's not the most extensive one. What is interesting is as you get close to the beach is how much of the the coastline now is was it what it was like 78 years ago because again there's been erosion bits have collapsed away so whether there were trend you know obviously you can see were there trenches right on the edge of the cliffs at the time is that what yeah that's what these orange marks indicate um yeah these, uh, yeah Different so you know 
things have changed a bit around there now. So it's hard, you know, but they're, they're the bank, but it's not as extensive uh, as well. When you add them all together, when you when you add 74, 73, 72, 71, given how small an area those four cover, really, um, there's a lot there. But individually, 71 is not the most exciting of them, uh, really. Yep. Yeah. Um, again, it's not a not a not a not a giant fortress you know what people usually think it is um but uh that's why again i think it's so interesting is really to find out the truth about what it really was now um paul we were talking about um at the beginning of this the uh the bombing and stuff like that mm -hmm. and um how it it overshot not by miles but you know by a little bit this is the only area that i've ever seen to where the bombing was you can see the the remnants of it right here this is wn71 you can see yeah. the craters right here Bam, 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 bam. Four of them hit right there. So if this was just maybe a few hundred meters, you know, to the west, that would have just taken out WN71. <laughs> so, so yeah, very interesting. That's that's the old I think there might be some other ones if I look at more aerials, but like in terms of the bombers, you know, overshooting their jumps completely. It's like, no, they they actually did come close in a lot of places. So that's that's about as close as it gets right there. Yeah, no, definitely. So, any kind of final things about seventy one? Because I'm, 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 you know, I'm conscious of the fact you've you've got to go and have your lunch, and uh, we've got a bottle of champagne in the fridge that we were sent by post <laughs> by my previous customers. That's really great. So, um, oh, it's fantastic stuff, and we want to have you back on when you when you finished off sixty two and and sixty and and sixty one. Then you can come back and do that. Then there's sixty five and sixty four. Yeah, and then you can move and do the other ones, and you know, we'll 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 be here forever. We'll do Stutzpunkt, uh, yeah, Colville sur Mer and all that. So, yeah, I, um, no, I, I, I do it anytime. So, uh, I'll, I'm just going to keep doing what I do and I'll share info with you and you'll see my posts and everything. And, uh, yeah, we'll keep doing it. But in terms of, yeah, final thoughts on 71, I don't think so. I think, uh, we pretty much covered it. I think that was the last point I wanted to make was that 71 yeah. probably had the closest call in terms of the bombing and, uh, hit right there at the edge of the escarpment. Um, but oh, and one, one more thing, and that's that, uh, you know, you see a lot of people talk about the seawall, uh, the seawall of Omaha Beach. And that's what this blue strip is right here. Uh, I get, I've get, i always gotten the notion people think that's a German fortification. It's mm. not. It's not yeah. at all. It's a, It was built, I believe, like in the early 1900s. It is, uh, it is for beach erosion. It is to stop beach erosion from happening. So that seawall, which it's there today, it's still there. Um, that has nothing to do with German fortifications at all. No, the, the, the only bit that's not original is the bit right near in front of Vade Sons 72 is they had to kind of patch that up and restore it. So the same kind of time they did the National Guard, but there's a kind of a non-authentic bit there. But once you get kind of 100 meters to the to the east, it's all the original wall because you can see it had this kind of an H pattern of, of a lighter color stone inside it. And you, when you look at those aerial photos taken in 43, and you look at it now, you can see the same the same pattern there. So it was the wall that was there now, it's the wall that was there in 43, and you see it in the pre-war uh, postcards taken of the area. It, it, as you say, it was always there. There was, of course, in some areas, a lot more shingle in front of it than there is now. There's only a little bit of shingle to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, the west of um, of 73 now, or well, 72, 73, but there was more shingle in front of it. But the wall, yeah, was was always there. But um, yeah, yeah. So thanks for mentioning the sea wall, and we we can we we're definitely going to have you back on again. But before I want to let you tell a bit about where you are with your fantastic film that you've you've last time I spoke to you hadn't filmed it. Now you filmed it. So in addition to doing Omaha Beach Study, you are making you well. You've you've well, you're in the edit edit process. I get now. I guess now are you? I am. Yeah. So um, a few months ago, yeah, I'm a filmmaker. And uh, a few months ago, I uh, uh, was for I was working on for about a year to make this uh, film. It's my first feature uh, called Reveille. And uh, it is a it takes place in Italy along the winter line in 19 late 1943. And it's about it takes place. It's about both German and American perspectives. And uh, it is really questioning kind of the morale, uh, not the morale, the, the morals of war and like what exactly like the rules mean exactly. And it's a, uh, it's a real kind of dilemma because it's about guys taking care of wounded, wounded enemy soldiers and not knowing exactly what to do with them. They should put them out of their misery. If they should, you know, give them aid, what exactly constitutes as, you know, uh, the right type of killing. Is it murder? Is it not murder? It's all these questions that I, you know, really wanted to come forth with. And, uh, 
and again, a, a part of the war that's really not explored that much, you know, the, uh, you know, Mediterranean and everything like that. So I was really, I just went nose, you know, uh, just nose dived into the whole thing. And it was a great experience. We shot the movie in, uh, you know, in, in, in a few weeks and uh, over in Missouri, because we had a great location that really doubled well for uh, the, for Leary Valley uh, in Italy around uh, San Pietro, where the movie takes place. We got some of the best people to work on it in terms of costume and kit and all that stuff. Mike B, uh, Brian McCallion, Myra Miller. I'm sure you, I think you know Myra Miller. Yeah. yeah uh, and, and the photos are seen. There's nothing wrong. Like us, us people who know our uniforms and stuff. I was like hoping to find just one little thing. Just nothing. I, I saw nothing. Dude, we, was like, the, the, the fitness levels of the, of the actors are good. The kit is good. The location is good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, 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 outstanding. So um, yeah, no, we'll, we'll, and, and the, I've put the links into you to the to the web page for that in the description below. So folks, you can go and support Michael and in, in his his filmmaking endeavors as well. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're in the editing process now. The film was shot, and uh, now it's all the we've we've edit, it's about like ninety percent done in terms of editing. Now it's all fine tuning, taking care of the effects, fully sound effects, all that stuff, all of the nitty gritty details. You know, and again, I love nitty gritty details when it comes yeah, to well done. Well. Yeah, so well, uh, we will we will try and bring it in under two and a half hours. So at least we haven't. Got, so I mean, it was absolutely amazing talking to you. People are saying they didn't realize what the show was. They didn't quite know what it was going to be like, and they've they've loved it. Uh, others didn't realize it's been so long. I mean, we could have nearly watched Lawrence of Arabia instead of, the, but it was really, really good. And it's the it's that it's that realization we get it. People say to me, "Do we need any more books on D Day? Is there anything else to be said about normally?" And the answer is. Yes, yes, there are. Things. Of course. Maybe it's not, it's not going to change the outcome of the day. The Americans are still going to win. The Germans are still going to be defeated. It's just, as you said, they're getting into the weeds of just determining the answer to some of these questions. What was behind that wall? What was inside that bunker there? Which What was that gun's purpose? Uh, mm -hmm. Were these bunkers connected, et cetera, et cetera? And it's that kind of information that all it can do is add to our general understanding of this. So it, there we are. Well, the bots are just coming on my on the, on the, on the sidebar there. But anyway, it's been brilliant talking to you. And um, yeah, so will you come back again and do something else? Oh, I, I um, you know, I'd love to come back anytime, man. Uh, I can, I, I've, I, uh, I can start looking into some other WNs. You know, we can start getting into that sort of thing. Uh, whatever you want to do, man, just let me know, and I'd love to do yeah, it again. Yeah, I think, I think historians are going to be contacting you to do photo re research for them, but it's going to be fantastic. Anyway, we'll bring things to an end now. So, folks, I've got nothing at you for you over the weekend. Um, I will see you all again on Monday for Animals at War Week, and then there's other things coming up. But it's been absolutely amazing talking to you, Michael. And Thank for those you, of you sir. watching this, I hope you've learned something. I certainly did. So this is Paul Woodhead for World War II TV saying I'll see you all next time. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye.